Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Andrew, we can't hear you. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry about that minor delay there. Um, welcome back to the second part of the Off-Grid Masterclass series. Once again, my name is Andrew and I'll be moderating. Uh, this next part of the series will again be the three hours long with a 15 minute break. Remember also from yesterday to make sure that you're logged into the webinar through your own connection. This is required so that we're able to accurately prove your attendance. Also, it's the only way for you to gain access to the brief quiz at the end of the program, which is a requirement if you're trying to obtain continuing ed credits. I'd also like to remind everyone that if you have a question for our speaker during the webinar, to please see the dark gray questions bar that's in the panel on the right of your screen. And um, please feel free to ask any questions at any time. If by chance you should happen to lose sound through your computer speakers, uh, please see the audio tablets in the panel and you'll have the option to dial in with your phone. Uh, for anything else that might come up, please call Half Moon's customer service at 715-835-5900 and I will post that number again for everyone in the chat section. Uh, with that being said, I am happy to turn over the microphone once again to our series speaker, J.R. Cromer. All right, uh, welcome back everyone. Andrew, we may need to check with Richard to make sure he got into the program correctly. Okay. Um, but with that, let's uh, get back into the program. Another good solid day ahead of us. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> so where we left off last time is we were talking about installation techniques. Um, National Electric Code in the U.S. essentially requires these module level panel electronics. That's what the MLPE stands for, is module level panel electronics, uh, to be mounted behind every solar panel uh, when installed on the roof. And so uh, that can actually be a challenge for off-grid design because most of these module level panel electronics devices are intended for the grid tied market. Um, it's not a huge deal. Most of your high-end battery inverters uh, can can kind of trick the uh, the you know, third-party manufacturer's inverter from turning off on or off. Um, but effectively, you know, for the the, the intents and purposes of this slide, uh, if you're installing on a roof, you're going to find yourself mounting these boxes. Uh, up on the roof. And so installers have their, their own particular way to cable manage uh, all of the extra wires associated with these boxes. Uh, I uh, tend to select a, a rail that has this kind of uh, U channel in it. It makes a, a U and that allows the, the cable to kind of drop into there and then uh, periodically I'll drill little, you know, wheat poles for, for the water to drain out of this rail. Um, but I do that because then the, the cable is nice and protected by the rail. It it's, goes underneath the rail. So the, the MLPE and the modules that go on top of the rail actually secure the, the rail into, um, you know, se secure the wires into the rail. And then, uh, you know, there's there's other kinds of cable management, uh, and you generally end up using a mixture of cable management devices. You got the uh, you know the the tie wraps are great for you know just just wrapping completely around the rail and bundling up any cables inside the tie wrap to to get any loose cable nice tight and done up. These metal clips, they're called module clips. Therefore, securing any loose wire to the inside of the solar module frame. 
Uh, so sometimes down on the ground, uh, we'll figure out where these clips need to be positioned for whatever kind of install we're doing and, and do some pre-clipping and pre-cable management down uh, on the ground on just some additional items you'll generally end up needing on an install. Uh, but effectively, what I do is I measure out where the optimizers are going to go and then I bolt them to the, the cable, and then I take the optimizer whips and I lay them into the cable and then tie wrap them in place with the tie wrap just kind of serving as a, a temporary hold. Um, you know, tie wraps fail over time. The metal cable clips, uh, the cable is very easy to tug and pull out of. And sometimes you'll just use those cable clips to be a little extra hand uh, because when these modules get within a couple inches of the roof surface, you can't really stick your arm under them and grab the cable where you need. So you might use a cable clip to pre-position some wire. If I get my wire you know, into this channel, secured with a tie wrap, and then when the module frame goes on top, it secures the cable into the, the rack uh, permanently. And so I don't have to worry about uh, things like birds and critters chewing up the wires that are at least the ones that are inside the rail. And uh, I don't have to worry about the, the cables coming loose over time and dragging across the rooftop. Uh, the other trick that I do is most installers will put the module level panel electronics right behind the um, solar panel that they're installing. Instead, what I do is I locate the, the box one panel over, so one panel over to the side. And what that allows me to do is, is two things. One, I can mount the module completely on the rail and then reach underneath and grab my whips and plug them into the optimizer. So I don't have to deal with this kind of juggling process of connecting the clips to the module while putting the array, you know, the module onto the rack. Uh, you end up kind of juggling uh, your install up on the rooftop uh, to make that process happen. When I put the optimizer or the microinverter, you know, next to the module, that allows me to fully mount the module onto the rack and then do my cable management, which actually saves a little bit of time uh, and it also improves workmanship. And so after the, the optimizer and module are mounted, uh, I then just, just uh, kind of wrap the, uh, let's see here, it's my go-to meeting commands. But I just kind of kind of wrap the uh, where is my go-to meeting interface? Oh, let's see. Um, oh well, I could just use this. Uh, I just kind of wrap the uh, the cables, the the slack, bundle it up to make a, a nice and tight connection um, by by dragging the optimizer out to the edge of the next module. You're already you know, eliminating that much slack in your cable that would otherwise just be bundled and dragging down on the rooftop. Finally, I get to my rooftop transition box at the, the end of the array. And then so my last module on the array actually has two optimizers, one for the very last module and one from the, the module, you know, adjacent to it. And then I, I transition into my box through a cable gland. There's specialized cable glands that you buy that are specific for the, the solar cable. And so the wires kind of get get kind of managed up into that rack. And uh, the end result is even though you have tons of, you know, devices that are, are you know, behind each module as you go down the rail, you can look underneath the array and just see empty space. And that's the sign of, of good uh, installation workmanship is to be able to look underneath the solar array. And even though you have all these wires and boxes and cables underneath it, you can just see, you know, straight through it underneath, you know, those cables are, are being tucked away into the, um, um, you know, into the the rail as quickly as possible. 
Uh, when you have purlins um, or battens, uh, like on a metal roof, uh, where the, the attachment points are running east-west across the roof, whereas rafters generally run north-south up the roof. Uh, you can go with different kinds of racking configurations. Um, sometimes they're a little more finicky uh, to install, uh, but it's possible to install in landscape versus portrait, um, and that's largely driven behind, by... Um, you know, if your attachments are going to go up the roof rather than across the roof, but you can mount an alternate configuration. So even if your attachments go up the roof, you can mount in landscape. If your attachments go across the roof, you can mount in portrait as well. Uh, I think the, the takeaway is just that with, with a Perlin based house, you have to be a little bit more aware of where your racking uh, is actually going to lay out. Um, Installing these attachments uh, can initially seem like a, a daunting task. And uh, the reason is you're, you're actually putting flashing behind and up and under the shingle. And it's not just going underneath this shingle layer, but then there's a, another shingle layer on top of that. And this flash pad actually goes all the way up under there. And so the kind of the hardest part of installing this flashing is uh, you'll take a like a pry bar and and very carefully underneath the the rafters you can kind of start to identify how the flashing goes in to the rafter and where any roofing nails exist and then you take your pry bar under there and and pry up the roofing nail uh, which leaves behind a hole uh, but that hole is going to be covered up with uh, flashing and you know a lot of installers though you know if you can you can pry up the nail and then uh, you know hammer it down below to where it's not going to be interfered with but at the end of the day you know sealant is your friend uh, flashing goes over the sealant and that makes a, a waterproof connection it's not these solar attachment points that cause the leak on the roof usually the leaks will occur um, due to pre-existing rooftop obstacles uh, where the installer is, is kind of tromping around on the rooftop and maybe stepping on some flashing between a chimney and the, the roof. You know, that empty space on the roof becomes a walkway. Um, and so it's usually those pre-existing uh, flashings uh, that are already, you know, 10 years you know, into their life cycle uh, that start to be that need special attention when it comes to to uh, waterproofing. And so, uh, there's there's a couple of ways to identify the rafters. You know, a common way is just to use like a rubber hammer and hammer the roof and kind of hear or feel where the rafter is. Um, if you get close enough <laughs> and you end up missing the rafter, you know, let's say you drill a a, a pilot hole. And once you you drill the pilot hole for your lag bolt, you can you you have a tinier hole that you know will tell you if you're hitting the wood rafter underneath the decking or just going into empty space. And as long as you're you're close enough, you know missing is not good, obviously. But if you're supposed to put your hole here and you ended up putting it there and you found out that you missed, well, that's why you put mastic in the hole and then flash around it. So. Hopefully after your, your first pilot hole, um, you can kind of be a little bit more precise if you miss. Uh, installers will take a little wire up on the rooftop and poke it through a missed wire hole and kind of twist it around to feel how far off from the rafter uh, they got. Um, and on top of that, some racking systems if the attachment spacing was two foot on center, the roof deck would be plenty strong. And so when you're actually just with the decking and not the rafter. So, you know, going into the rafter is the best practice. If uh, you're concerned about being able to hit the rafter appropriately, then you would add more roof attachments to strengthen how the array goes onto the roof. Um, but the most secure attachment is one that's solidly attached to the rafter that's flashed and sealed uh, as kind of the, the standard practice. 
And so what I'll do is I'll go into the rafter, uh, into the attic, and I'll I'll measure out my rafter spacing. So you already know if your rafters are 16 inch on center or something a little off, or if they're not exactly uniform, or if they're 24 inches on center. Um, you know, you, you get a good idea. And so I'll get up on the roof with my hammer and, you know, I will start at the top of the roof and kind of with a, a wide out pen, I'll start, you know, just kind of marking where I feel the holes go. And then I'll go a few feet down and kind of without looking at this upper section, I'll start marking holes as well. And then if, if, you know, I do this in a couple of spots to kind of see how good my hammer test is, is lining up and where I get really good hits, you know, I know I'm lined up and where I don't get good hits, you know, I know I have to, to go back and pay a little bit of special attention uh, to where that rafter is again, just to avoid, um, you know, to, to make sure that you're on point with your roof penetrations. Once you've identified where your rafters are, you know, you pop the, the roof line with chalk and uh, that makes your, you know, that kind of completes your grid up on the roof to where the, these attachments will go. Uh, it used to be back in the day, you know, we didn't have uh, attachments with integrated flashing. And so there are lots of old installs out there where it's just, you know, the attachment point directly lag screwed through the rooftop. And even when done that way, under good workmanship, that won't leak. I mean, the the pressure between the lag screw and the rafter is is quite strong. Um, so the you know the the point is uh, you know so the solar industry has had a decade to figure out you know best waterproofing techniques. And while there is still some innovation going on in this field, the standard practice is to get up on the roof, identify where the rafters are drill a pilot hole and then put uh, a sealed flash flashing uh, above the pilot hole and dra uh, drive a lag screw through it. There are kind of uh, laser stud finders that you can use to identify these rafters. There's a little bit of a trick to it. You need to get a take a thin flat surface to put on the rooftop because the shingles throw off the stud finder. And the other trick is you can't use a $40 stud finder. You got to use a, a $500 used, you know, $800 to $1,200 new stud finder, one that has enough depth to get through the roofing surface into the rafter. So there are even, you know, more professional ways to identify where the rafters are than just hammering the rooftop. Uh, metal roofs, I think that, um, Generally, the, the homeowner is more concerned about the water integrity of their metal roof than they should be. Um, there are attachments designed to penetrate and screw into metal rooftops that use very high-end butyl tape around the flashings. And it, to, to some extent, you know, these kinds of screw-through-the-roof attachments um, you know, yes, you're poking a hole in the roof, but on the other hand, you know, if you're you on a metal roof, the the straight grid is already kind of defined for you by the metal roofing panel. So it's very easy to be on point on mark on a metal roof. So you shouldn't be drilling into empty space on a metal roof. And so that that screw attachment into the wood batten that's supporting the metal rooftop or the wood purlin that's supporting the metal rooftop is a very strong connection. I actually think they're better uh, of a connection than, you know, not penetrating, but using like a standing seam roof where you're clamping on. Uh, the, the problem with standing seam roofs where you're clamping onto the seam is all of a sudden the, the weak point becomes, you know, how is this metal roofing panel itself attached to the rooftop? And that becomes a, a more of an issue when you're not attaching to every single seam. And so all of a sudden, you know, one roofing panel has all the uplift load on that 
on that subarray being applied to that one roofing panel, and that can get out of spec for your standing seam metal rooftop. So, you know, the danger is in in the the spirit of avoiding roof penetrations, uh, you can create other problems structurally. And and the best way to avoid that is is just like with rafters, when you're doing a standing seam metal rooftop, you want to make sure that you're hitting every single seam as you're going across. And that might not mean putting a clamp on every single panel, but it does mean to make sure that your standing seam clips are hitting every single uh, metal panel as they go across the roof. And so sometimes these metal roofing panels are only 10 or 12 feet long. And so you have to keep that in mind um, for distributing your space. You know, the standing seam roof manufacturer, uh, solar racking manufacturers uh, will actually provide guidance to say, you know, attached to every single seam going across the rooftop. Um, however, a lot of installers, they're thinking, you know, spans of four feet uh, being conservative and solar rail being able to take six feet or eight foot spans, uh, your metal roofing panel on a standing seam metal roof no longer has that long span that you can take advantage of. So, um, but the, regardless, there's racking for every kind of roofing material. And in fact, there's even um, uh, accessories for metal rooftops uh, to help keep conduit runs, you know, up off of that roof surface. NEC has a pretty harsh uh, temperature derate for cables that are within one inch of the roof surface. And so uh, it's best to keep the, the conduit runs and cable and all that nice, nicely managed. So here's like a, a flashing for, um, here's a flashing for, uh, you know, Spanish tile rooftops, that's just a tile replacement. There used to be a hook that fits underneath the tiles. Uh, the more professional solution, uh, now that it's available, you know, your, your many solar racking companies, particularly those that specialize in residential, will now have a variety of tile replacements to fit your particular tile roof. Uh, transition boxes. You know, sometimes if I'm being lazy, I'm doing an install, I really just want to go out to Home Depot and buy or buy electrical supply house for that matter and just buy off the shelf stuff and get it to site and do the project. Um, especially parts in solar are, are designed to make life easier. And usually the added cost, you know, this is, this is like a, a $90 uh, junction box that's designed specifically for solar. Whereas, you know, you might go and get a, a, a plastic junction box at Home Depot for 30 bucks. You know, like, oh, do I really need this? Well, this, this specialized $90 transition box, you know, not only does it have kind of flashing built into it so it can get underneath the shingles, um, it's, it's all about how to make that hole in the rooftop watertight. And so they're they're flashing around it, and and there's other ways to do that. You know, you can get pipe boots uh, that are are flashed um, on a metal roof. You basically you can't flash a metal roof. So on a metal roof, you basically put screws all the way around uh, the pipe boot <laughs> to to kind of press it onto the uh, roof surface as much as possible. Uh, the other thing to note about the the specialty junction boxes, as opposed to uh, kind of what's on the right, which would be, you know, you could kind of put together something like this uh, through kind of Home Depot items. Um, but the problem is starts to be the height up off of the roof. So we just said, you know, you want your conduit and cable to be up off of the rooftop. And yes, you do. But between the, the roof surface and then the, the little flashed standoff for your solar rail, and then you got your solar rail that attaches to that standoff, and then the module frame itself goes on top of the rail, 
and then you got the top of your module frame. And so between the roof and the top of the rail, you know, you only have about two and a half inches. And then to the top of the module surface, you generally only have, you know, about four inches uh, maximum. And the problem with uh, the Home Depot junction boxes is they're often six inches deep. And so I don't like putting, you know, just regular junction boxes on the rooftop. I would rather have, a, you know, the conduit transition into the attic and then put my junction box uh, inside the attic um, or just run it straight down to the inverter, uh, which is common the case when you're using solar edge or in phase. Well, what's nice about the uh, the Solideck rooftop transition box is it's only about two and a half inches deep. And so when you go and use the kind of specialized, um, the specialized part, you can fit it underneath the solar array and hide it and achieve a, a better kind of aesthetic than if you have the junction box located off to the, uh, the side of the array. Now we, we talked about yesterday how DC wiring inside the home needs to be in metal. And personally, I think that this is solar discrimination. You know, there's, you know, AC does not need to be inside of metal. You know, Romex, you know, it's a plastic cable with the power inside of it. You know, that's a plastic cable and it's running all throughout your house. You know, it's not in metal. But where is this metal requirement coming from? Um, you could think that the metal has to do with grounding. Okay, so if there's a short, it grounds out to the metal, which is attached to the grounding system, and that connects to the ground, and so it gets the, the ground fault current um, out of the home as quickly and safely as possible. That's not why DC wiring has to be in metal. You know, you can get confused. There's all sorts of like, when does metal conduit constitute as a ground path or when does it not? That's not what's going on here. The metal for DC cabling is simply for additional protection. You know, so if there's rodents in your attic, if a do-it-yourselfer is putting a nail through some drywall, you know, they want to give it a little bit more protection than a... Uh, you know, than what a plastic sheathing would get you. Now that said, metal conduit, even EMT conduit, it's not, you know, fail safe. So jur some jurisdictions, like in densely populated uh, high rises, like in New York City, you know, they may have additional requirements to say, no, not just metal, but rigid metal or intermediate metal. You know, they might have some, some additional requirements, but the standard, NEC code requirement is just metal. Now, I like doing internal conduit runs because they look better. There's a lot of the solar fires out there, if they weren't caused by just poor workmanship, um, then they've been caused by long exposed metal conduit runs up on the rooftop. You know, it's this is more of a commercial design issue than a residential design issue. Um, but once your metal runs become, you know, 100 feet long, the thermal expansion uh, can start pulling the conduit out of the fittings, even if the system was installed um, almost 100%. Now, there's, there's ways around that. You're going to have floating ballasts for your conduit up on the roof rather than fixed in place ballast to kind of help the, the conduit expand a little bit. But that's really not the scope of this program. If you want to achieve a nice internal conduit run, but the idea of installing uh, EMT conduit and pulling cable through the attic space is unappealing, um, thankfully, there are 
other things you can do to avoid that entirely. So generally that will uptick your material cost. But, you know, in this case, I, I just really find myself loving spending a little bit more on balance of system material to ease the installation. So what I get is I get MC cable. That stands for metal clad cable. So you can buy MC flexible conduit that looks like this, except the cables aren't included. And, and pulling cable through this kind of flexible metal conduit is, is pretty difficult. And, and generally, uh, you only do that for short lengths. But MC cable comes with the cable pre-bundled, pre-wrapped into it. So you don't need to pull that cable through. It's already in there. And you can literally just, just you know, strap this thing to your rafters and have your cable already inside it and not need to avoid, you know, the, the cable pull. And so, you know, often in an installation, I will run this MC cable through the attic and then I will uh, come up on the top of my rooftop, you know, inside this junction box and terminate my cables uh, at that point inside the junction box. And then I'll run my MC cable all the way through the attic and out the other side of the building where the external solar inverter is located or on into the battery room. Uh, where your battery inverter is located. If you have unsealed batteries, you would then need to paint the metal cable to help it uh, prevent corrosion. And so for this MC cable, I do a couple of other things. Often I'll upsize it to number six, which is pretty overkill. Number six is uh, you know, most solar uh, residential home runs are using number 10 cable, and most quality installers uh, for longer runs will see value in upsizing it to number eight cable um, to eliminate voltage drop. So there's really not too much performance gain from upsizing to number six. The reason why I upsized number six is I'm buying a bundled cable. And often with bundled cables, they will undersize the ground. And it turns out that a uh, number eight ground wire, you need to run up to the rooftop to ground the racking up on the roof. And so by selecting a, a number six cable, the, the ground wire becomes, you know, one size smaller, becomes number eight. And so, you know, I can buy generic MC cable that's number six, and it comes with a number eight ground, and I can just run it between the inverter and the rooftop and that's all the cabling that I need to do. Now, this stuff runs, um, you know, three to four dollars a foot. So you don't want to, you don't want to. It's the worst thing to do in electrical is to buy too little cable, but you don't want to buy too much of it either. And then uh, the other thing that I look out for with metal clad cable is: do you want it to be? Do you want it to have four conductors inside of it? plus a ground, or do you want to have two conductors inside of it plus a ground? So sometimes with, with my solar edge circuits, you know, they can hold a, one solar edge circuit can hold like 25 solar panels. And so um, many smaller residential arrays will only have one circuit, and then that, that 6-2 would be fine. If you're doing two circuits of solar edge, then I get the 6-4 metal clad cable because that allows me to run a positive and a negative for both circuits um, plus my ground. And then if I have subarray sections, if I have one section of the roof over there and another section of the roof over there, I'll get another solar deck box and then I'll just run the 6-2 metal clad between the two sections. So, you know, the, the takeaway is the, the idea of penetrating a roof and putting a hole in the roof and flashing it and sealing it and then running all this conduit and cable inside the attic can sound very daunting, but with the right material selection, it can be done uh, you know, quickly and in a professional manner. And that, that involves you know, some knowledge of balance of system material, which is kind of the, the name of the game and uh, solar design. 
uh, or the, the finesse of solar design. You know, so there are, are solar cable. Solar cable is a specific kind of cable. It's designed to be, you know, tie wrapped to the side of a solar rail in an outdoor environment. It's a very thick jacket. It's a very robust jacket. And so uh, there are, are specific cable glands you can buy from solar supply houses uh, to fit solar cable uh, to, to make a, you know, that transition out of the conduit into the solar array. Uh, there's likewise, there's fittings to say, you know, okay, well, you know, the problem with MC cable is that it's only rated for damp environments. It's not rated for wet environments. And so you might find, you know, on that other side of the attic where you're coming out the outside of the house onto the inverter that uh, as soon as you get out of the attic underneath the soffit, you want to transition into, um, you know, a, a, a wet rated conduit. And, you know, that does not need to be done inside of a box with terminations, you know, through proper planning, you can buy, you know, an extra 10 feet of the MC cable and then unwrap the MC cable and then add on a, um, so that the cables are just exposed and then add on your metal conduit and land directly onto your inverter without uh, a splice needed. And so with, with uh, a good solar design, and uh, you know, I still think that there's, there's plenty of room in design optimization for solar you know, and project planning. You know, a lot of installers will, will just get up on the roof and start figuring it out. But you know, as building designers, we can say, well, look, you know, let me spend a couple hours on the design and material list and that'll save you you know five times as many hours out in the field and that's not just a good practice for labor budget but it's also better for the rooftop because you know whenever you're walking up on a shingle roof you're scraping grit off of the shingles and that alone is reducing the life of the shingles so you, know, you have to be aware of the rooftop temperature and um you know, not work it when it's super cold, not work it when it's super hot. Um, but the best way to keep that roof in good shape is to do as much work on the ground as you can and and kind of select your material to not spend as much of time on the roof as possible. So you know, I'll pre-assemble rail sections, I'll mount the optimizers down on the ground uh, and, and do a lot of project planning so that the install can be done quickly. Uh, ground mounting is, um, it's a good option. You know, the, the main added cost of the ground mount is, is the equipment rental. So, you know, often on a solar array, you know, especially residential type roofs, you know, you may not be renting any heavy equipment to do the install. Uh, on a ground mount, you're either having to auger out the foundation holes with a bobcat and pour in concrete, or if you don't want to auger out foundation holes, they make helical posts and helical ground screws to go into the ground. The, the cost of these posts and ground screws turns out to be about the same as augering and concrete. So the, the helical posts or helical screw adds uh, substantial cost to the foundational posts, uh, but the idea is that you save that with avoiding the use of concrete. You know, rocky, <laughs> rocky terrains in particular, um, you know, your auger may not work so well. You may go down and hit some rock. It may be better to have a pointier uh, ground screw to kind of shove small rocks out of the way and twist down to where you need to go. And so there's a, a couple of different ways you can make your posts uh, level. 
You know, it, it certainly helps to have a laser level and to be driving the posts uh, based off the height of the laser level. That saves you a lot of time. Uh, an older school method of, of leveling would just be to drive all the posts out there and then use a uh, bandsaw to cut off the top of the posts to make them kind of level after the fact. And that might, you know, depending on how uneven your terrain is, that might be the better approach. Um, you know, the one thing I don't like about residential style ground mounting is that you get these this this front post of supports and then this back post of supports. Uh, maybe some cross reinforcement as well. And what that does is it makes it very hard to get up underneath the solar array. And why would you want to do that? Well, you know, hopefully you're not having to get up underneath your solar array all that much, but you know, maybe for lawn maintenance, you're going to have a lot of wild grass growing out in the field underneath the solar array. Um, you know, you, you want to be able to get under there with a weed racker and it just starts to get um, crowded. So at the utility scale, the way they solve this problem is they don't use two rows of posts. They just use, um, they use one row. And so here we have a, uh, you know, one row of posts, and that kind of clears up the underneath side of the array for better groundskeeping. Uh, the only issue with this is you still have to deal with the modules being only so high up off of the ground. So even on a system like this, it's not easy to get underneath the array. Uh, it's just easier. Well, then at the utility scale, they have the the single axis tracking is very popular right now you know not a tracker that does north south east and west but just a tracker that does east to west it it represents a good marriage of design simplicity uh but also increased production and it would make you know uh groundskeeping much easier to be able to tilt the array up on one side and then go tilt it up the other way on the other side So I, I think it's kind of interesting that we don't see much tracking going on at the residential level, but we do at the utility scale. You know, the utility scale market would not be doing tracking if it were not cost effective. And so what this is implying is that, you know, there is a path to cost effective tracking, but it, it may not be at the residential level. It may be that you need to get a project of sufficient scale for the tracking to be justified. One thing that's kind of interesting about utility scale modules is they're a little bit taller than uh, residential modules. So there's there are 60 cell kind of short mo shorter modules that are just as large as you can safely manage up on a rooftop the utility scale modules are a little bit taller and that makes them a little bit harder to manage on a rooftop, but it doesn't matter as much when you're down on the ground. And so going with a slightly larger module, what's called a, a 72 cell module, as opposed to a 60 cell module, um, can fit a few more panels onto your ground mount frame than otherwise. So it's generally more cost effective on the ground to go with 72 cell larger solar panels. As a, as a finer note, you know, usually solar panels um, are just plugging into their next door neighbor, positive, negative, 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 positive, negative. And then you get to the end of the circuit and you build a home run cable that goes back to your either rooftop transition box or uh, your inverter in the case of a ground mount. Um, what's neat about the slightly taller solar panels is that the, uh, the, the cable whips 
are also slightly longer so that they can be mounted in both portrait and landscape. And what that means is when you mount in portrait, these, these cable whips for these 72 cell modules are quite long, and that gives you enough distance to not just go to the next door neighbor, but to, to skip it and go up to here, and then skip it again, and then skip it again, and then skip it again, and then skip it again. And then they come back over the modules that they skipped, and uh, the savings is you don't have that home run cable anymore. And your, your cables, home run cables kind of start and stop at the same point. So it's, it's not so much the, the cost of that home run cable that you're saving that makes this cost effective. It's more that, you know, that the electricity has to run through you know, all of these cables anyway. So the amount of the electron coming to, to here, it's taking the same path to go here and then back down again in a more stretched out manner. And so you're eliminating, you know, a good uh, 30, 40 feet of circuit run by doing this leapfrogging or skip stepping method on ground mounts using 72 cell modules. So if you're really trying to get style points and you're on the ground, you can, you can consider that kind of alternate wiring technique. Um, you know, that's what they do at the utility scale. Uh, we, we had mentioned before that DC optimizers are, are kind of problematic. And the main reason is that uh, Solar Edge is the company that makes these DC optimizers, and they're really intended for a, a grid-tied product. They don't, they don't have a ton of off-grid options. They do have a battery inverter, but it's not strong enough to power the entire house. That's probably going to change in the future, um, but, but right now what you would do is AC couple and have a, a battery inverter next to the solar edge inverter. And the question becomes, well, well, what happens when the batteries are full and the sun is still up? Well, at that point, the, the battery inverter mimics a grid failure to turn the solar array off. So it fluctuates the building energy just enough not to power down the building or cause any blip in the building electronics, but just enough to trigger the sensitive solar grid detection mode to turn the inverter off. And that's, that's how the battery inverters regulate AC coupled solar arrays to make sure that these dumb solar arrays that are pushing every electron outwards uh, don't overcharge the battery while in an off grid mode. So it is, it is possible to uh, use solar edge in an off grid setting. One advantage of DC optimizers is that they, they step up the voltage of the array to its maximum allowable before transmitting that voltage back to the string inverter. And when you step up the voltage, you decrease the amperage. And that means the, the home run cables themselves can be thinner gauge uh, than if they had higher amperage. So usually like voltage is like the skin of a water balloon. You know, how tough that rubber is, is going to determine, more, have more to do if the balloon blows apart uh, than anything else. Whereas the amperage is more like the, the amount of water inside the balloon. And so the lower the amperage, the smaller the balloon could be, so long as it's sufficiently tough. And solar cable with that extra thick jacket is very tough. It's a direct burial cable. It's a outside of conduit cable. It's a up on the roof exposed to sunlight cable. It's a very, solar cable is very robust. So often I'll just direct bury it between the ground mount and the home, um, provided that there's no heavy access between the two, like a road or something like that, where um, the weight of a vehicle could be, you know, impacting that soil. And and then what's what's nice about this is the solar edge system. You know, let's say you have a ground mount that's very far away 
from the home. So let's say the home is in the middle of the woods, but there's a field at the edge of the property. So you want to build your solar array out by the field to catch good sun, but you want to bring that power a uh, 1,000 feet to where the home is. Uh, being able to step up to higher voltage, you know, it's the same technique that utilities use to step up high voltage from the power plant. So the electricity coming out of the power plant is not high voltage transmission electricity. It gets run through its own transformer to step up to high voltage for transmission. And then it has a separate transformer to step it back down to go into your home. You know, the, the DC optimizers kind of function in the same way. So even though like putting module level panel electronics behind every single panel uh, does increase your project cost compared to not doing it, there are certain design constraints where um, all else being equal, you know, it would result in the better project uh, to take advantage of that high voltage. So the fact that these things are mandated on rooftops really isn't that huge of a deal breaker for me because they do um, add value, you know, regardless of how they're used, sometimes to the point where it completely justifies and negates any cost increase associated with buying more stuff. So, you know, in the context of this conversation, what I'm saying is, you know, hey, if you have a ground mount that's far away from the house, you know, you might be using solar edge optimizers anyway. You know, what about tracking? Get back into, you know, so let's say we have a ground mount at the edge of the field. It's going to be a solar edge array uh, for the step up in voltage to go back to the home. What if I want to squeeze a little bit more power out of that solar array by making it tracking? What would I do? Well, you know, I've looked at dual axis trackers and, you know, the, the point is they, they get quite expensive in terms of their foundation requirements. You know, being able to, to lift an entire solar array up on one single post, you know, we were talking about, you know, one row of posts for a smaller array. And then uh, even at the residential level, you know, they might even have two rows of posts. And and uh, the more posts per panel, you know, the, the shallower the foundation. And so a single post tracking system needs a very deep foundation or it needs a very wide <laughs> concrete pad uh, to keep it in place. And so that, that cost of the foundation work starts to run away with you, um, particularly at the residential level. And for that matter, I think, you know, these giant double axis tracking systems, they kind of have a similar aesthetic to, uh, you know, satellite dishes of the uh, late 70s and early 80s, you know, these giant, maybe even late 80s, <laughs> these giant satellite dishes, I don't think the look ages very well, especially, you know, putting a big flat square, you know, right in your face. So I think the, the owners of these systems kind of have a emperor's new clothes impact going on where they, they like the novelty of solar and they like it being seen and they like the social impact of it. You know, will that aesthetic last over time? I, I don't know. Um, Whereas the single axis trackers, they're not trying to lift, you know, nine panels on one post. They're, they're, in fact, they're, they're really only trying to lift one panel on one post. And so you still get into kind of shallow foundation depths. I think there's a lot of good um, value optimization in the optimization in these uh, utility scale trackers. And so why not, if you're building a ground mount at the residential level, you know, why not add the additional parts and pieces you need to make it a tracking array? Well, for, for one, you know, in an off-grid design, you would think, okay, well, you want it to be tracking because you want that extra power. But, 
you know, thinking back to what we learned yesterday on sunny days, a well-sized off-grid system should be filling the battery all the way back up to the top. And so, you know, all, all that a, a tracker is going to do is, is make the battery bank more full sooner. And so you don't really need the, the, the tracking on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, on a, on a partly cloudy day or on a cloudy day, you're not going to get much energy. On a sunny day, you should be full back up to the top. And so the, the only thing that the, the tracker will do is in the, the early morning, it'll take a little bit more load off of the batteries and onto the solar array. And, and likewise, the same thing in the afternoon. But is that better than using the money just to buy more battery capacity? You know, solar panels are already, uh, when we're talking about the context of off-grid systems, relatively cheap. So, yeah, I don't think customers are, are missing out by not doing residential tracking. Uh, the, the only caveat being, you know, when you live off-grid, it's, it's not so much the, the hour by hour energy that you'll miss without tracking it's the seasonal difference between summer and winter so perhaps modifying the racking to uh, be seasonally adjustable is something worth considering um but but even so you know the the bed, the the standard solution is just to make the array a little bit larger um, and and not have to worry about the complexity of maintaining a racking system or even designing or procuring one because it is not a well-served residential market. When I got into solar 10 years ago, there were more solar tracking systems on the market than there are today at the residential level. And that's for two reasons. You know, one, solar's cheaper, so there's less of a need for residential tracking. Um, and, and two, all the residential tracking companies are now utility scale tracking companies and they don't care about, you know, tweaking their designs or going back to what they used to be, you know, when they have this large, well-established industry uh, to take advantage of. So on the one hand, utility scale does it and finds it to be cost effective. You will get more morning power and evening power. And, you know, that's when I'm, you know, people are using a lot of power in the morning and evening. And so that will take some strain off your batteries. And you get the winter time uh, increase, perhaps, you know, that, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Do you want east-west production from tracking or do you want north-south production from tracking? Um, you know, it, it, you know, or maybe you do a compromise and you do northeast to southwest tracking and, and, you know, vary the array on a control circuit to optimize the energy value on a, on a you know, season by season basis. So most people look at these arguments and say, no, nah, I'll just, you know, I'll just buy more, more solar panels to make my ground mount a little bit longer. Um, that wasn't a, a satisfactory answer to me. You know, I, I looked at, okay, well, you know, these, you can get roller bearings that fit on top of the pipe caps and they're, they're not expensive. They're only 20 bucks. So it's like, okay, if I put a roller bearing here, and a roller bearing here, and a roller bearing here, and a rolling bearing here, and this is a, a thirty thousand dollar solar array. You know, I'm only spending, you know, with all the hardware and stuff like that. Let's just say fifty dollars each to put a hinge on the array. So putting the hinge on the array is is can actually be done quite cheaply. Moving the array at that point becomes an issue because you have a a very long very bendable, um, very expensive, and very heavy kite when the, the array is spinning on that single axis. And so, you know, whether or not you just get the thing there for mobility and then anchor the array into the ground with some seasonable adjustment, that's all right. 
you can actually get uh, an actuator strong enough to move one pallet of solar panels for about 600 bucks. So to take a one pallet ground mount all in and turn it into a tracking array, you might be looking at, you know, you got the controller, you got the actuator, you got the pillow blocks. Um, you know, you might be looking at, you know, for the controller, 200 bucks. You have to factor in the power supply to the controller if you're not taking that directly from the solar array. And so let's just say uh, in a, in a do-it-yourself system, you could probably upgrade a, a uh, 7 kilowatt, 8 kilowatt solar array for, to a tracking array for around $2,000. But then you're on the hook for the design. Um, it's not the traditional way to go. You know, if, if the tracker doesn't work, it's still going to produce electricity. Uh, I guess I didn't put my picture in it. You know, we, we did a, a rack where we said, okay, well, let's design the rack to make it tracker ready. And we'll go put in the, the pillow blocks and make it seasonably adjustable, um, mainly because the, the owner didn't want to pony up the extra money for the actuator and control board and stuff like that. And the, the end result was it didn't become a tracker. <laughs> you know, the homeowner, you know, just kept it fixed in place. So, um, you know, we've we've built tracker. We've built a tracker or at least partial tracker before uh, doing the do it yourself method. And, you know, what I can say is as a do it yourself project, you might find that making your solar array a tracking array is cost effective. But by the time you add the cost associated with getting something like that done professionally, uh, you get to the point where you might as well have the professional installer just put on some more solar panels. So it's a, it's about a wash at the residential level. You know, if you if you take a, a nice do-it-yourself ground mount project and you add two thousand dollars to it, uh, it's going to add you know an eleven percent cost to the project and it'll increase your production by about ten to eleven percent as well. So you know, you'll get your value out of it. It's just not so much more of a tremendous value uh, to make it commercially viable at the residential level. Uh, but at the commercial level, you know, most utility scale projects are now tracking projects. And there's even been some uh, renewed interest in double axis tracking uh, now that solar panels are becoming clear on the backside, you can get clear back sheets, and that makes uh, you know solar panels suspended up in the air a little bit more productive. And that makes double axis tracking a little bit more productive. So some utilities are, you know, they say, okay, well, we didn't think single axis tracking was cost effective, and we were wrong on that, and now everything's single axis tracking. You know, let's get a little bit more close look at double axis tracking with the. Uh, bifacial solar panels. All right, so most generators are variable speed. Most generators will operate at 25%, 50%, 75% or full power and use different amounts of gas at different load levels. Uh, there are There is a question of do you want a, a, a large on-site generator or a small on-site generator? And that can depend upon your design. You know, uh, a smaller generator is cheap. And a smaller generator, you don't have to worry about, you know, burning up your inverter electronics. You know, if the generator output is smaller than the inverter output, then if the current flows through the generator and then through the inverter and then into the home, and it would be doing that if the inverter is controlling the generator. If the inverter is complementing the generator with solar power, if the generator is charging the batteries uh, through the charger that's built into the inverter, which is usually what happens, well, then you don't want you know, if you have an 8 kilowatt inverter and a 16 kilowatt generator, you don't want to use the charger 
built into the inverter to charge the batteries from the generator power because you might you might be feeding the inverter with too much power from the generator so does that mean you want a large generator and a small inverter well you could but you'd want to isolate them you know you'd want that large generator there to power the whole house if something's going wrong with your solar array uh, a smaller generator has its own different issues. You don't want the generator to be too much too much smaller than the solar array battery inverter because you don't want the battery inverter to be outputting so much power that it's overpowering the generator. You know, it's all about it's all about is the current from the generator going to pass through the inverter or is the current from the inverter going to kind of pass through the generator? And if, if those answers are yes, then you want them to be the same size. And if the answers are no, then you keep them isolated from each other. And, and you know, maybe that might mean the generator has its own battery charger if it's a larger generator. So there, there's different case uses for large or small generators. You know, my, my preference is for small portable gas generators because they – they can keep the batteries topped off and they, you know, have a, a nice emergency use for them um, where if everything's going belly up, you know, you can always, you know, move a portable generator. Um, but for larger off-grid homes, you know, uh, a stationary generator is going to be the, the way to go. And so what... What got me a little confused when I was designing an off-grid home and it came time to select the generator is you go to Generac's website and they say, hey, we have a generator that is specifically made for renewable energy systems. That sounds like a no-brainer. You know, it costs a little more money. So maybe you know, you're thinking, well, do I really need it? Or not? Well, it turns out the answer is no. Um, what's What's interesting about the the renewable generators? You know, Generac makes one, so I'm just using it as an example. Is they're very high end generators, and so it says you know even when there's no sun or wind, your batteries will continue to deliver electricity and drain, and you can use our generator for. Uh, you know, backup power for your home, warranted for off-grid use. What does that mean? Well, a regular generator, that's not the renewable generator. The regular generator that's sitting on the side of the house is not there to run the house fully off-grid every single day. You know, a regular generator is sitting there so that if an emergency strikes, you can still power your home. But it gets into power quality issues. You know, the power quality from a backup generator is not as good as the power quality from the grid. And so Generac is saying, now, wait a minute. If you're trying to use our generator that has worse power quality and is not designed for power outages that occur every couple of days, but instead a power outage that might not even occur during the entire year, you know, different case use. If you're going to be running your house full time off of our generator, you need a better quality generator than what we're selling as a backup power system. And so that's where the renewable generator line comes in is this is a better quality generator than standard. So what does that mean? I'm going to get back to this slide. Well, that means is they, they have uh, larger oil pans, so you don't need to change the oil as frequently. Now, if you're running your generator, you know, once a week instead of once every year, you know, having, you know, better oil life and oil capacity is a good thing. You know, a, a better resonator. That just makes the generator a little less loud when it runs. You know, again, if the generator is going to be running on a routine, regular basis, the noise of the generator does become an issue. Now, then we get into an upgraded alternator. 
You know, and so this, this alternator is designed to give a clean power signal even when the generator is not running at full speed. And that's really the, the, the extra value from these renewable generators is that they uh, produce a cleaner electric signal uh, than, than they would do otherwise. So then the, the question becomes, do I really need that clean power signal with extra voltage regulation? And the answer is, well, it depends. You know, if you're in Alaska and you know that in the wintertime, there's no way you're getting around reliance on your generator. And so your home is going to be running on a generator for a month out of the year. You know, that's running the house full time off a generator. And that's where the extra power quality really comes in handle, handle, um, becomes useful. But if you're only having a generator there to back up the solar array, you know, to only really say, OK, well, we've designed our system. So there's going to be one or two weather systems a year where the generator becomes needed. But other than that. We're not going to need our generator. And even during that system, the generator is really not running the house. The generator is just charging the batteries back up and then turning off and that's it. You know, if you're only using the generator for, you know, uh, less than 100 hours of runtime a year, you know, buying the more expensive renewable generator is not necessary. Now, in fact, there's some some kind of redundant parts that you get with a, a renewable generator, like a control circuit, which are generally that stuff is being driven by the inverter anyway. So the inverter battery inverter will have its own generator module and generator control board. And so if the generator comes with its own controller. You don't you don't end up using it. So um, you know, the, the point is you don't need a renewable generator for a well-sized renewable system. You can just use a standard generator. If you're in a climate where you know you're going to be running the house off a generator on a regular basis, that's when you upgrade to the renewable generator. Now, in my model, we model generator runtime. And so the, the best guess is like, well, how do you know when to spend more money on batteries or accept that the generator can run longer and use less batteries? How is that cost effective? Well, we need to kind of guess um, – how much gas the generator will use. So here we have a natural, uh, this renewable generator, and it's rated for natural gas or propane. And it tells us if it's running at 100% of the load or 25% of the load, how much gas or propane does it consume in an hour? And so like in my model, I'm modeling a 15 kilowatt generator and I'm running it at 100% of the load because I'm assuming it's charging the batteries at 15 kilowatts for, you know, four hours. And the design we, we talked about yesterday. And so, uh, you know, I've gotten some comments from audience member, from one audience member in the past that he didn't think that this math was, was correct. And I've looked at the numbers and looked online and I haven't found a flaw in it. So, you know, what I would, would like... <laughs> is for you to take these numbers with a grain of salt because I'm not really a gas generator guy. But, you know, you look at a, a 25 kilowatt generator running at 25% of the load for 24 hours. And it's using 220 cubic feet of natural gas per hour. If that cost of residential delivered natural gas into the tank is $13 for every thousand cubic feet, you know, that generator running all day long at 25 kW is, um, you know, going to generate, and at 25% of the load, 
is going to cost seventy dollars. And so, you know, that's a natural gas generator costing forty-five cents a kilowatt hour. Propane costing twenty-one cents a kilowatt hour. You know, the the takeaway is using a, a gas generator on site is going to end up running, you know, upwards of twenty cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, when you're talking about upwards of 20 cents a kilowatt hour, there is such thing as running that generator too much and instead, you know, reducing the generator runtime by uh, increasing the battery bank size. And so I'll throw the generator runtime, you know, into my model, assign it a cost, and then just look at, okay, well, if, if my batteries, if expanding the battery system costs seven hundred dollars a kilowatt hour and i increase my battery capacity by x many kilowatt hours my generator runtime reduces by x many kilowatt hours and i save you know x dollars on gas and so at that point you know i look at okay well what is the intended payback of the system if the payback of the system is 15 years and uh, i can get less than a 15 year payback on reducing the generator time by increasing the battery bank size, you know, that's my that's my hinge. Is I, you know, I look at the the payback of the system and say, you know, can I increase the payback by adding more by making the project more expensive and adding more batteries and reducing the generator runtime or can I increase the payback by reducing the batteries and increasing the generator runtime? And that becomes kind of the, the critical design hinge and cost optimization. You know, is it better to have a day's worth of storage and then rely on the generator or two days worth of storage and rely less on the generator? You know, you can, you can start, you know, modeling the ultimate right size of the system based on that function. And so, so generally, I'm looking at, okay, well, well, here's, you know, again, graphing out your energy use and graphing out your battery bank size and graphing out your production and looking at the graph to develop a narrative of what's going on, that, that visual assessment of this graph can really help you better understand what a right size generator is. Because say here I have a, a 90 kilowatt hour battery bank. And I'm not going to buy a 190 kilowatt hour or a 200 kilowatt hour battery bank to accommodate year round operation because that's just too expensive. I'm not going for monthly operation of the generator. I don't want to go the entire month of December or the entire month of January running a generator. You know, but what I'll look at is in those critical months, when do I run my generator and what do I really need out of it? So what I can say is, okay, well, here's a weather cycle where clearly I'm going to have to run the generator. I might have to run it once or twice and do a full recharge once or twice during this cycle. And likewise, here's another cycle where I'm going to have to run the generator maybe once or twice to get it back up to its healthy state. Here's another cycle. It's actually one cycle and then another cycle where if I went with a 90 kilowatt hour battery bank, I'd be draining it all the way down to zero and having to run that generator again to give me a full recharge back up to the top. But then the next few days are sunny. And so I kind of wasted all that gas recharging my battery bank because if I could have just lasted another day, the sun would have come back out and that gets into like energy management issues and weather predicting and you can do all that with energy controls and it's it's pretty amazing um but another thing you can do instead is just instead of having a, a 90 kilowatt hour battery bank you know adding another 30 kilowatt hours and making it a you know 120 kilowatt hour battery bank and that way the battery drains and then it catches back up and re the sun recharges the battery during this time and you don't have to run the generator. So by, by adding 30 kilowatt hours to the battery bank, we've reduced two instances of generator runtime and then that remained us with 
two larger instances of generator runtime, which the generator might have had to run twice as much. And so we've we've by by adding 30 kilowatt hours of storage capacity to the battery bank, we've reduced the the generator runtime by about 33 percent. But then if we added another 30 kilowatt hours to the generator, we would reduce the generator runtime by an additional 0% because we would still need to run a generator, you know, during these events anyway. And so there is a, a level of right sizing your battery bank such that on certain weather patterns, like these, you can avoid running the generator with a larger battery. And then there's other battery weather instances where you can't avoid running the generator anyway. And so, so yes, there is a, a magic point in your, your model where you'll be, you'll be plugging in a, a 80 kilowatt hour battery bank versus a 120 kilowatt hour battery bank and your generator reliance will substantially reduce and then and then that will just leave you to a couple of times a year when you actually do need to use that generator rather than relying on it every week or so and so i'm actually you know kind of what i do in my off-grid designs is i get in and i i kind of count how many times the generators are running and then you know assume if i if i have a slightly larger battery bank you know, then my generator runtime is is much less frequent to get me fully recharged. And so how much more will it be to expand the battery bank by 30 kilowatt hours and then reduce my uh, generator runtime by 33%? If that is within the payback parameters of the project, if it improves the payback of the project, then that's when I go back to the customer and say, you know, you know, if we expand the budget by six thousand dollars and spend that all on batteries, you're going to, you know, make your money back all the more quickly. And uh, the kind of customers who can live off grid without uh, worrying or maintaining or taking a hands-on approach to their system will generally have the financial capability to spend that incremental more uh, spend on the battery bank. Now, some other arguments I've come across about larger generators versus smaller generators is that, you know, they can charge the battery more quickly than a smaller generator. Um, and, and so, you know, my kind of, guidance is don't overkill the size of the generator. Select a generator that is about the same size as the output capacity of the battery inverter and and you'll you know stay on course for a, a good uh, re working relationship between your generator and your inverter. All right, let's, uh, we're going to take our break right at 12.30 Central Time. So before that, let's review some single line diagrams, kind of better explain what's going on in these images. So here we have a, a double stacked battery inverter pulling off of the same battery bank. And we have a, a, a generator or grid source, one of the two, um, plugging into the AC side one of this box and, and powering our load. Well, pretty simple. This is called a, a one-line diagram. You know, one-line diagrams are simplified wiring diagrams. They don't give you all the construction detail you need, uh, but generally uh, most inspectors will just want to see a one-line diagram so they can better understand what is going on, maybe with some call-outs of, of cable sizes and calculations. Whereas this is more like a traditional wiring diagram that shows you exactly where all the wires are going. It's a little bit harder to read, but it does provide a lot more detail. 
So what's going on in this wiring diagram? Well, um, rather than start at the switch gear and decipher what's going on here, you know, generally we'll start at like our, our function. So here's our grid connection. And since this doesn't show a grid connection, this is a critical load panel versus this is a grid connection. So we trace our power lines. We say that our, our grid connection is coming at the top of these breakers. Now then we have our, our generator connection and the generators coming in at the top of these breakers. Let's see where these breakers go. There's no bus busing along these, these breakers. So they, they're wire in, wire out with nothing connecting them in between. So here's our grid connection. And it's coming in the top. And it's going out two places. One has this A and this B breaker that are tracing back to the inverter on one of the inverter terminal blocks. You know, one for each. Then the generator is coming in and coming down. And then the generator is coming out the other side, and it's also going back and landing on one of the terminal blocks of the inverter. That's two terminal blocks of the inverter. You know, here's our, our critical load panel coming up and feeding the top of our critical load panel. So we've gotten those, we've gotten these, and we've gotten these, and we've gotten these. What are these right here? Well, this is also going to trace back to the inverter and kind of come along the bottom there and then come up the top and land on the uh, inverter. And so we got a couple of different things landing on the inverter. We got the, the, the single generator connection being wired across two breakers that then go land on each inverter. So these are like seven kilowatt inverters. This could be a, a 15 kilowatt generator and it divides the power between the two inverters. And so we don't have to worry about, you know, our, our inverter terminals being fed with too much power from the generator, you know, passing through all that power and burning up. You know, if we had a large generator and a small inverter and that generator power is being fed into the inverter, the terminal blocks might not be rated for that current. And so instead of having the generator hardwired into the inverter and taking advantage of some of the abilities for that, like the inverter has a battery charger built into it, and the generator does not. And so we want to use the inverter's battery charger while from the generator, then they need to be connected together. But if, if this was like a 20 kilowatt generator on a five kilowatt inverter, we simply wouldn't connect them. We would, we would switch the generator power onto a transfer switch between the battery inverter and the house, and we just let the house run off the 20 kilowatt generator until the sun comes back up and recharges the batteries and then switch back over. You know, there's, there's a couple of different ways to skin the cat. So we got the generator landing on the, the inverter. We also got the grid landing on the inverter. And that tells us two things. One, um, that means that the inverter most likely will be a grid-tied inverter and backfeed the grid. So this Schneider inverter is capable of being grid tied and back feeding the grid. You know, so if we have surplus power from our system, we can still sell that back to the utility, even if they don't really pay us much money for it. Or uh, there's another outlet for the critical load panel that's, that's coming up and powering the same thing, powering this critical load panel. And what, what you aren't seeing here is a, a transfer switch that's built into the inverter that says when there's a, a, a power outlet from the grid, you know, turn off the grid terminal block and keep on the backup power terminal block, which then outputs to its own power supply to feed that critical load panel. So, um, 
you know, so this is this is a, this is the AC power distribution block, and the main reason why it's so complicated up here is that we have a double stacked inverter, and so each you know the inverter needs to go from one generator to two inverters, one grid connection to two inverters, you know, uh, one load panel to two inverters, and so we got a bunch. And if we had three inverters or four inverters or five inverters, you know, there'd just be more and more breakers you know, stacked along this uh, mounting block. Now down here, we have the DC side. We have uh, the solar array coming in through a charge controller. You know, the solar array has voltages up to 600 volts. You know, the charge, the battery bank's a 48 volt battery bank in this case. And so the charge controller takes the, the variable voltage that bounces up and down from the solar array and then makes it nice and smooth uh, coming down to the battery bank. Well, let's see how it gets there. So this lands on here. This lands on here. The battery bank itself is being connected to this, this uh, bus bar for your negative, And then we have a fused bus bar for the positive. That's for a, a negatively grounded configuration. Um, if you do a, a, a floating battery bank, then you need overcurrent protection on both ends of it. And so this is coming off the battery bank, and that means that this is a 48-volt DC bus bar, and this is a 48-volt DC bus bar. Here's another DC bus bar. Well, what's this for? Well, we trace it back. It traces back to each charge controller. Okay. Well, where's the other bit come from? Well, the other bit comes from the, the solar array. So this is where the solar array is now being plugged in to the charge controller. And then the charge controller comes out and feeds the DC bus. So this side on these breakers these are actually 600 volt DC breakers taking the power from the solar array and putting on some overcurrent protection and switching so that you can power down the charge controller if you need to service the charge controller. And so these are 600 volt DC breakers at low amperage. And then the, the power is converted into 48 volt power at high amperage. And so we see little small wires going into these smaller breakers because the, the amperage is less, so the wire gauge is thinner. And then we have these larger breakers because the amperage is higher. You know, volt times an amp gives a watt, so low voltage, high amperage, you know, high voltage, low amperage. You know, here's our low voltage, high amperage. So it's thicker gauge cable that goes between the uh, the inverter and the battery bank. So these are uh, 48 volt DC terminals. This is 600 volt DC. This is 48 volt DC. Uh, so why don't we take a, uh, we're an hour and a half in. Why don't we take our 15 minute break and we'll pick back up at 10 till. So 15 minute break. Back at ten till one. Central time. So we'll see you in fifteen minutes.
We're going to pick back up in about a minute, or one minute. All right, uh, welcome back. So, keep on getting into our program. Lots of more fun and exciting things to talk about. So there's um there's a lot involved in designing the off grid system, and you know especially with thinking about expandability of the system as it's not uncommon for clients in these battery systems, not to have all the money they need. Um, and it is possible to simplify off grid setup. So, you know, you could say, okay, well, you know, I, I don't need, I don't have the money right now for two inverters. So I'm only going to run you know, I'm going to use a grid tied inverter and only have a little bit of backup power during a power outage. And that's fine. But then if you, you know, start to eliminate things like switch gears, you know, then you lose this ability to actually wire the batteries in in an AC coupled manner. You know, so it's 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 more complicated to set up the system so that you can add on more battery inverters later if you need the power. Uh, but if you go with a non-stackable inverter, you know, then you you're out of room to maneuver if it comes time to expand the system. Um, you know, what we're showing is some wire sizing. The way I develop my, my line diagrams, because uh, most of the solar design software out there, even the most advanced one called PV Complete, for, you know, I'm, I'm going to, this was done in a cheaper program called Solar Design Tool, which is only geared towards smaller residential projects. But generally what I'll do is I'll design the system first using manufacturer provided sizing tools. You know, so this is the, the solar inverter sizing that tells how many modules can go on which inverter, solar only. And so I'll go and I'll model that design in a computer software that generates a one line diagram that lacks battery capability. And then I'll export this file to CAD and hand draw the battery components to it. That's kind of a fun part about being in battery design right now is it kind of feels like solar design 10 years ago when there weren't design tools available and you had to do things by hand. Um, the design tools that have been developed are great, but they're kind of focused on the batteryless market. So. You know, I start with a, a batteryless design, export it to CAD, and then do the rest of it by hand in CAD. Um, but this is this is like a design software where you put in the array layout and it generates wire sizing, conduit fill calculations, national code reports, and then I'll go back and I'll change these settings to say, okay, well, you know, maybe the the design tool. Um, has said that you know everything should be in in number ten PV wire, but uh, I'll go and and maybe upsize all of it to number eight if if and just keep one wire size on site. Maybe these are two different kinds of wires, so I'd probably just get number ten PV wire and number eight regular. 
but you can check the things like, you know, are all your conduit sizes the same? And I'm not trying to say you have to use the same wire size and the same conduit size throughout the entire project, but you know, if one conduit is three quarter inch and everything else is one inch, it can be easier just to keep it all in one inch. Um, I don't know, I just kind of included this slide for reference. It just puts in, this is, is kind of dated, but it, it shows how, you know, this is a, a bill of material from a supplier, you know, when it comes time to actually buy the product. And a lot of this material can be developed through going through solar design tool and, um, and, and generating most of this list automatically. And I've always found it to be much easier to work the supply chain, you know, starting with a complete bill of material for bid than approaching the distributor and saying, you know, I don't even have a solar design. You know, they'll do the design work for you, uh, but it'll also be that you have uh, less control about your material pricing, less ability to put the project out for bid. All right, so let's let's talk about home automation. Um, I've recently just put a, a wrote a two hour class on home automation. We only have about thirty minutes to talk about it uh, in this class, uh, but it is a critical part of off grid systems, and it's it's a new functionality. So I don't think most off grid systems have energy automations built into them, but it is a feature that's starting to come up on uh, more and more solar inverters. We'll see battery inverters already have relay outputs to drive mechanical relays. Uh, if you're not an electrician, you know, and even if you are an electrician, wiring up relays might not be something you get into, um, but luckily now with, with wireless technology, you might not even get into rewiring your solar panel, your electric service panel for load control. You might just do it, you know, at the device level, at the actual power outlet itself. Uh, so, so just as an example, uh, I did a, a limited budget off-grid home. You know, they didn't have the $100,000 it would need to do a high-end off-grid system for a 5,000 square foot home, they only had 65,000. But they wanted that whole house power. And so what was what we found a, a 12 kilowatt cheap all-in-one inverter that could be connected to the battery bank and run the power house off-grid. The problem is, you know, if you're running the house on a 12 kilowatt inverter and a house goes over 12 kilowatts in power, you know, yes, these inverters have burst capacity to be able to ramp up for short term loads. But by short term loads, we're talking about one minute loads or less, you know, not, um, you know, a air conditioning system that's going to run for 15 minutes straight. And so how do we keep the building within the parameters of the battery output capacity of the inverter. You know, on top of that, you know, we talked about discharge rates for uh, batteries and how even a lithium ion battery is uh, improved by a slower discharge rate rather than a more rapid discharge rate. So, you know, let's say the air conditioner clicks on and it drives our load up to 12 kilowatts. Are there other loads that we could turn off during that time, you know, to make sure things like the water heater and the air conditioner don't run at the same time? Um, the, the thermostat is, there's a reason why the Nest thermostat, you know, came to market first when it came to when it comes to smart home technology. And that, that the reason is your thermostat offers a tremendous amount of ability to control the power level of your house. Um, for instance, you could simply, uh, I have a time of use rate where I have a higher rate between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. than I do the rest of the day. And I simply turn my thermostat off 
send a signal to, to put it into off mode for those two hours. I just kind of coast and it clicks back on again at eight. You know, thermostats have some control built into them. This is not a, a, a new problem and it's not a problem that hasn't gone without a solution, but they've been very like trade specific solutions. So, you know, if you're a, a air conditioner installer, you might be used to programming a thermostat on when to kick on um, auxiliary backup electric heat or when not to, when to just run off the uh, heat from the heat pump. Um, so there's different trigger levels. And, and what we're seeing is these trigger options. Uh, this is for, a, a, this is based off, you can run different relays coming off the battery inverter based off a low battery state of charge. You know, off a low battery state of charge, you might wanna shed load. You might wanna turn loads off. There's also high battery state of charge. You know, when your battery is completely full of energy, you might want to run a fountain, a water fountain out in a pond. And when the battery is not full of energy, you might want to turn that fountain off. You know, have a nice, you know, visual signal built into the facility that says my battery is at a healthy state of charge. You know, what electricity is decorative? What electricity is superfluous? You know, you might have those loads running at a full state of charge and other loads running not so. But these, these hardwired relays don't really give you expanded smart functionality. You know, for example, I want to make sure that my water heater turns off during heavy load. And I'd like my water heater to run when my batteries are full and the solar array is up. So I'm running off solar power and not the battery power. So I'd like my water heater to only run during the day. I also don't want to run out of hot water. So if it's a cloudy day and I'm not getting much uh, production and I'm not heating much water, I want to make sure there's an override to turn that water heater back on. And so the, the kind of hardwired relays and circuits uh, there are some of that functionality built into battery inverters, just like there's that functionality built into thermostats, um, but it's a very binary level of control. If this state is like this, turn off. If that state is like that, turn on. And then not much additional flexibility to throw in additional variables. Uh, for instance, uh, a relay on a battery inverter might force you to choose between a relay that only triggers when the battery is at low voltage or a relay that only triggers when the battery is at high voltage. Uh, you might just within the battery room itself be using those relays, you know, to run a, a heater if the battery box drops below freezing or to run an air conditioner if the battery temperature gets above 90 and so with, with using the existing relays on the battery inverters, you may have to choose just one, you know, one use for that relay. So I recently installed a smart thermostat. Um, actually gotten into a couple. One problem we ran into with uh, a recent smart home is the air conditioner contractor, you know, only wired you know, four thermostat wires instead of all eight. And the reason they did that is their, their proprietary Rheem Econet thermostat only needed the four wires. And so the, the homeowner wanted to install a different thermostat, the Nest, and they couldn't because the Nest requires, you know, a traditional eight wire thermostat and they didn't have those all connected up to their uh, conditioner. Um, thermostats have battery power, but they also have uh, hardwire power from from the wall. Oh, the C wire, a hard a hard power cable. And so the question is, do you need thermostats to be powered devices or can they run on batteries alone? You know, the batteries for the thermostat are really there so that the thermostat continues to, to run 
during the power outage so it doesn't lose all of its program settings when the power comes back on. But if you take like a Nest thermostat and the Nest will say it's battery powered and you run a Nest thermostat off of its batteries only, you're going to be swapping those batteries out every two weeks. You know, Wi-Fi is a very energy intense communication protocol. The, the, the off-grid kind of thermostats I use, the entry-level thermostats, not $300 thermostats, but $40 or $50 thermostats, uh, don't use Wi-Fi. They might use a, a different communication frequency, like a, a lower frequency like RF, or nowadays they call it ZigBee or Z-Wave uh, to communicate. And those could be battery only uh, communication. And what I think is interesting about wireless communication to thermostats and wireless control systems is the thermostat really no longer needs to be on the wall. It could just be hardwired directly to the, the indoor unit of the uh, air conditioner. And then you could have, have room level sensors where you pick and choose which one you want to be, you know, driving the, the thermostat or not. Uh, the only the only kind of advice I have on thermostats is if you're swapping out your thermostat, uh, make sure you're powering down the whole air conditioning system uh, because you can you can blow fuses inside the ther inside the air handler by just taking the a powered thermostat off the wall and swapping it out with a new one. So you might think, oh, this is just low voltage coming out to the thermostat. I don't need to to worry about powering down the big units, the double pole breakers, uh, but those low voltage wires are connected to those big units and they do have fuses that can can short if you are you know, touching these small wires together. Um, so here's, here's just some different thermostat settings and, and I guess what I was trying to say in this is these thermostats can, can uh, have triggers built into them to drive, you know, room specific heating. And it would be nice to, you know, have this kind of level of control, uh, but have it do other things than, than what it was originally intended to do. Um, for instance, what if you could just turn on a, a little space heater in a room rather than the electric heat inside the indoor unit? I'm just going to skip over this for a minute. So the system that I use for energy automations is called Home Assistant. And uh, you know, just some, some interesting things about this is energy controllers do not have to be very expensive at all. Controlling and just sending little, you know, on-off signals to all these devices, it's almost like, you know, in the, the Apollo space missions, how they're able to land a... Uh, a lunar lander onto the moon and the calculation, the computing power required to do that could be done like on a graphing calculator today. You know, so a lot of functionality can be controlled through a very small amount of computer processing. And that's, that's real neat because that means the computer itself doesn't need that much power to run. And so energy controls, right now I'm doing energy controls on my house and I'm running it off a, a $40 computer. Um, I have a, a special antenna so that this is a Raspberry Pi. It's a $40 computer. It has an Ethernet output. It has Wi-Fi built into it. It doesn't have that radio frequency that I need to wirelessly communicate with my thermostat. And so I buy this. This looks like a USB drive. It's actually an antenna that is a USB drive antenna that gives the Raspberry Pi this communication frequency or this, this Z-Wave frequency. Um. There, there's a number of smart hubs on the market, like uh, Google and Amazon are examples of smart hubs. Samsung makes a smart hub called Smart Things. Um, let's see, Apple makes a smart hub called HomeKit. 
Now, I use a smart hub that's open source called Home Assistant, and this is actually software that is free to use and free to download. Uh, the code is maintained by the users, and so there's, there's an active support community for this product. And what I like about it is, is a lot of smart home hardware and the companies that provide the software for it, you know, they may or may not be in the game for the long haul. And so there are instances of people buying into smart home devices and smart home platforms only for the manufacturer to go bankrupt or to stop continuing the device. You know, uh, Best Buy thought that they were going to get into smart homes. So they developed their own smart home brand. And then later they decided, you know what, um, it's going to be Google and Amazon doing this stuff. So we'd rather just get back to what we were doing, which is selling their products rather than trying to make our own. And so all of Best Buy's branded smart home products kind of uh, lost their value. So in the smart home class, we get into like cloud connections versus local connections. Home Assistant is a, a local connection. It does not require internet to run. It's free. It runs on a $40 computer. And it has much more functionality than, um, than, than other smart hubs that are more focused on giving users kind of instant gratification. You know, oh, I can turn a light bulb on and on, off with my voice, but they might not give you the uh, level of control you need to implement an energy control system on site. So I use Home Assistant as my smart hub. There are products on the market that are very good products, very good software out there. You know, this is this is a a sense energy monitor, and it it fits inside your electric service panel. They're not showing, you know, the real pictures of it. You know, but so this is a sense energy monitor, and it's it's three hundred dollars, and it. It you know fits inside your electric service panel. You know here's Schneider's you know equivalent, and these are like um, electricians have this kind of tool on their voltmeter to clamp around wires and and measure the amount of current that's flowing through it. You know what I I like about getting into you know, home assistant and open source platforms and non-proprietary platforms is that it gets you into being able to buy just the hardware and not some, you know, proprietary cloud service. And so instead of buying Sense's $300, you know, energy monitor, service panel monitor, I buy a... Um, kind of generic brand energy monitor that doesn't come with any software at all. And that can get a little scary when you buy one of these things, they're like 80, 90 bucks, and uh, you unpack it and you're like, well, now what do I do with it? Because it's just the hardware. I don't have any software to connect up to it. And there's a, a variety of devices like this for the Internet of Things. So this is a, a 40 amp switch that can be used to control an electric tank water heater. And so I have a smart home where we have two electric tank water heaters and we have them both on these smart switches and it makes sure that both tanks don't come on at the same time. And it also makes sure that the tanks don't run say when the air conditioner is running. So they're very effective and very cost effective products. They're, they're basically what an electrician would think of as a relay with a wireless trigger rather than a hardwired trigger. So you know they, they cost about twice as much as a standard relay, but they come with packaging and a wireless antennas, you know, that that make it easy. So I, I initially got into home automation trying a couple of years ago when uh, I was trying to do electricity controls, but Wi-Fi power outlets and Z-Wave power outlets, for that matter, were few and far between. And uh, you can you can buy um, infrared power outlets pretty cheap. <laughs> 
you know, a couple of years ago, these were $5 a piece. Today, they're still $5 a piece. The only difference is now, you know, your Wi-Fi outlets have, sometimes you can get them down to about that much as well. So, you know, back a couple of years ago, I was taking a Raspberry Pi and I was, you know, adding uh, infrared antennas to it and thinking, oh, I'm going to make an energy controller for my house that's cheap based off infrared technology. And what I found was the infrared signals, they get, they have a, they're smudgy. And so I was trying to control one power outlet with one signal and it would turn on a different power outlet with a different signal. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the problem with these, um, the, the, the lower energy signals you get, the kind of fuzzier they get to where you can get into, um, you know, the channel issues where, you know, one, you know, the, the age old, when, when these, when this kind of technology came out, how most people are familiar with it, if you're in your you know, mid thirties on up, uh, is wireless corded telephones. So when corded telephones first came out, they were a little bit like walkie talkies. And the danger was you could pick up on your neighbor's phone call conversation. And then that same wireless frequency went from, um, from zero hertz to four or 90 hertz to 433 megahertz. And it improved the, the security and signal quality a bit. But even so, the phone could not get very away from the receiver. You know, that was a wireless device that could not get very far away from the smart hub without it working. And then eventually there was another iteration of the technology, which boosted up to 900 hertz. And then you could use your cordless phone all the way on the other side of the house. And that's where ZigBee and Z-Wave are today in that 900 megahertz frequency, whereas Wi-Fi has continued to increase the frequency and increase the energy required to transmit the data, but that's also made the signal quality better and more data rich. So Wi-Fi is at 2,400 megahertz and your, your modern Wi-Fi devices are at 5,000 megahertz and your modern Wi-Fi devices can transmit video and audio and a partridge in a pear tree, whereas these lower energy devices uh, don't have the bandwidth for uh, much more than transmitting a bunch of ones and zeros. Um, and that, that has different internet security implications uh, that we can get into. You know, really why I like the Z-Wave or Zigbee controls is I can design these systems and pre-program them to work wirelessly out of the box without having access to the customer's Wi-Fi. So when you're designing like a smart home automation system, there's tons of gadgets, tons of devices. The setup time on site becomes kind of the critical factor. It's nicer to have everything pre-programmed out of the box. And how do you do that if all the devices are connected to the client's Wi-Fi? You know, it's uh, at the very least, you need to know their Wi-Fi password uh, but instead you can deliver your own wireless communication system right out of the box. And so I have a, a Z-Wave thermostat and I have a Z-Wave energy monitor installed in my electric service panel and it gives me real-time data of my energy use. And then I have Z-Wave power outlets that turn 120 volt devices on and off. And then my Z-Wave hub is my Raspberry Pi with a Z-Wave antenna. And let's just, just you know, we have some time, so let's take a, a quick look inside my Home Assistant build um, to see what I'm doing with it. Now, one thing that I haven't done yet that is kind of on my to-do list is Home Assistant has weather data built into it. And so it's actually possible to put a home into a different energy mode based off what the next day's weather is supposed to be. So if it's a cloudy day and I know that tomorrow is going to be cloudy, I might put my home into a low energy mode. You know, I might adjust the have adjusted thermostat settings. 
I might not run my uh, dehumidifier or air purifier as frequently. And then I'll wait for the sun to come up and blow it out of the water. And so that's kind of interesting, you know, weather-based and predictive weather-based contr energy controls are possible within this Home Assistant software. Here's my Z-Wave thermostat. And, uh, you know, it has similar functionality to a Nest, except it, it, it isn't a Nest. You know, it's a clunky, hard to push button. You know, it's really hard to go up to the wall and mash buttons on the thermostat. And these buttons nowadays, you know, don't exist as buttons. You just have to press the right spot on the screen and it's it's a cheap thermostat. It's a very, you know, there's the Nest is there because it's consumer friendly. If you don't have a Nest, you don't have a consumer friendly thermostat, except the clunkier thermostats are so much cheaper. And now I got the same value as Nest using my virtual controller. And so this might be a, a, a tablet mounted to the wall of the house if I really want a touch screen controller. Um, one thing that's that's pretty cool about the smart home controls is that um, they integrate with Google and Alexa via cloud services. So here's the Alexa integration, the Google Assistant integration. So now I can control my thermostat with my voice. I have a, a Amazon Echo in my living room, and I can say, you know, okay, you know, she who will not be named, set the thermostat to 69 degrees, or set the thermostat to 74 degrees, and it adjusts the setting just by a, a simple voice command, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, I'm more interested in the uh, automations. And before we get that, here's my, my Z-Wave network. I don't have a very big uh, device going. I have an air purifier on a smart plug, a dehumidifier on a smart plug, my energy meter, the thermostat, and my Z-Wave antenna. And with that, I can go into automations. And so here's my energy automation. And my my utility rate structure, I don't even I'm not living off grid. I use this for grid tide stuff, but my utility rate structure says, yeah, you know, at 6 a.m. I have a higher electric rate. And at um and at, at 8 p.m. at 8 a.m. the peak's over. So I only have a two-hour peak from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's very easy to accommodate with digital controls. And so at, at 5.59 a.m. You know, so there's this this time condition. Um, and then I also have, you know, it's the Home Assistant still has some user face is issues, but I've been using it for about six months now. And even within six months, the software updates for usability have been tremendous. And so I have this condition that says for every day of the week, because I have weekends are off peak full time. So for every day of the week, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m., I want you to turn off my dehumidifier. I want you to turn off the, um, the I guess I was playing around too much before class with this, but turn off the air purifier, uh, turn off the thermostat, and then wait for two hours. And then after two hours, turn the air purifier back on, turn the dehumidifier back on, turn the thermostat back on into its heat cool setting. And so going back into my, my overview page, well, let me show you another thing. And so here's my, my energy monitor data in real time. There's a little bit of configuration to this. You know, logging data is much more data intense than controlling instantaneous data. You know, like um, 
going going home and turning the hot water on and sticking your hand under the faucet, you know, you're going to say, ouch, that water's hot, and move your hand, and you're done with that transaction. If you then went and, and journaled your hot water experience every single day, every single hour, every single 10 seconds, you know, that that is more constraining on system resources. And so, um, you know, at that point, then you, you install Home Assistant on a, a actual computer rather than on a Raspberry Pi. But just for doing some very basic monitoring, some very basic storage, and then some very robust energy controls, you know, you can get there with uh, a cheap computer. And then basically when you run it off a of Raspberry Pi, it, it, the processing speed is slower. So there's it's just everything's a little bit slower before it pulls up. But in a home automation system, you know, initially it's a lot of fun to play around with all the devices and settings. But eventually you want to get it to the point where, like a thermostat, you know, people aren't messing around with it too much. And so here I see my, my home power. And I can see like when my air conditioner turns on or off, you know, when I'm running my heater or not. And then I can I can go through and, you know, just I can see what each device I can see what my, you know, my air purifier is not pulling that much power. My dehumidifier is pulling even less. And, um, you know, I can I can also turn them on or off. But if I were doing this in an off grid setting. You know, what an automation might look like is to say, you know, okay, we're going to do a, a load leveling automation. You know, so it's home power level. You know, so let's say, you know, I'm, I'm noticing my home power and normally I'm not above three kilowatts. And so I'm going to say load level, you know, above three kilowatts. And so I'm going to say, okay, well, when my um, device, you know, when my energy meter, you know, when the power level of my energy meter goes above 3,000 watts for more than 15 seconds, Then I'm going to take my dehumidifier and turn it off. And that's my, my energy automation. And so now it's, it's I, I get a little impatient with home assistant sometimes. It's better not, best not to, to click multiple times. But so here's my automation for power leveling above three kilowatts. And then I would need another automation that says load level below you know, one kilowatt. And it's the same thing, except now when the power meter is below a thousand watts for 15 seconds, I want to make sure my dehumidifier turns on. And so, you know, very simply, and for actually not that much money, you know, capital outlay, you know, I now have my home set up to load level to take my, you know, 500 watts of load from my uh, dehumidifier and, and, and I could do my, my refrigerator, I could do my electric water heater, um, you know, take those loads off line during peak times and then turn them back on during off peak times. And what that will, um, what that does is instead of having, you know, very spiky loads where all the loads come on at one time, which can be very hard on your batteries and very hard on your inverters, you know, instead it will, you know, with enough devices on load leveling and, uh, you know, what's nice about, you know, this, uh, the way I do it is I go after the heaviest devices first. 
but you can start to push. You know, there's nothing you can do about a four kilowatt water heater. You know, when it turns on, it's going to use four kilowatts of power. So all you can do is take whatever base load is on at the same time and say, okay, well, even though I know I'm going to have, you know, four kilowatts, this is actually a, a 10 kilowatt heating element within my um, air conditioning system. So whenever that 10 kilowatt heating element turns on, there's nothing I can do about it, but I can through reducing my base load, take about, you know, one and a half kilowatts offline during that time. So that's called Home Assistant, and um, you know, I run a, a YouTube channel and a website called Community Solar uh, that you can go to to uh, you know get access to course content, um, but not for credit. So you have to go to Half Moon for that. Um, so I just you know I just wanted to to, to show how, you know, using smart home technology for intelligent energy controls uh, can be run on a $40 computer and a handful of uh, device-specific sensors. Uh, it doesn't have to cost, you know, an, an arm and a leg. Maybe we'll have some more time to talk about that as we get on into the program. All right, so now what I want to do is kind of there's this concept that I've I've called Franken Solar, um, and it's kind of an in-depth look at forcing grid tied components to do things that they normally don't want to do. So what's the technical limits that we can push um, off grid technology, and how can we you know, if, if a building is not going off grid today, how can we plan for the building to go off grid tomorrow? You know, if uh, a homeowner has really good access to good grid tied policy today with time of use metering or net metering, and then that changes because electric policies can be subject to change, you know, how do we design our systems so that we spend you know the least amount of money today to get the job done but then also expand the capabilities of the system down the road uh, or up front too if if the budget allows and so here's kind of our starting point so solar edge most popular residential product in the united states for solar a lot of that's code driven because Solar Edge and uh, their main competitor, Enphase, uh, are market leaders when it comes to module level panel electronics, putting those boxes behind every single panel on the rooftop. And so, you know, when code began to mandate those boxes in 2014, you know, Solar Edge and Enphase's market share really started to rise. And uh, Solar Edge actually what came to market a couple years after Enphase, uh, but has since become the predominant market leader. That's because Enphase does a full DC to AC inversion up on the rooftop, whereas uh, Solar Edge only does DC to DC voltage regulation up on the roof and does the whole inversion in a central control unit down at the side. That's a little bit of a cheaper architecture to accomplish the same uh, boost in performance. Uh, so the microinverters with Enphase are much easier to install for beginners, and so they're very popular with do-it-yourselfers and first-time installers, whereas most experienced residential installers uh, in the United States transition to Solar Edge at some point. Okay, well, Solar Edge is a grid tied inverter. It's not a battery inverter. And that's kind of a dilemma that a lot of 
uh, solar owners are in today, where uh, the, the solar inverter manufacturers are producing products that are not intended for batteries. And even when they come out with a battery inverter, it's intended for a small grid tied battery to back up a critical load and not run a whole house. And so Solar Edge says, well, for backup power, just use a generator. That's well, all right. <laughs> it's, it's kind of goes against the point if you're having solar on site. It says the generator should not operate at the same time as the inverter. Operating the two together will void the warranty. And so Solar Edge is saying, you know, we we just we just don't support off-grid modes with generators. You know, you have to go buy a more expensive battery inverter if if you want to use a generator and you can't use our system at the same time. It's really not as bad as it sounds because you're either using the generator to charge the batteries or to power the house. And whether or not you're using the generators to charge the batteries and have the, then have the batteries power the house or just directly powering the house with your generator, you know, the same amount of energy is going to be you know, consumed more or less. So using a generator and waiting for the solar, sort of the sun to come up to recharge the batteries is not the worst design decision in the world if that's how it lands out on your job site. Um, you know, Solar Edge would consider a battery inverter of a third party to be the same thing as a generator like a third party power source. And so they they uh you know they're they're taking a hardline stance saying you cannot AC couple with a generator and they really don't want you to AC couple with a battery inverter but people with a true battery inverter that can power your whole house um but people do it because they have to. And so here's here's a a Schneider battery inverter you know, this is a, a true battery inverter. Uh, you cannot connect solar directly to it. You would need either a charge controller or a solar inverter for that. This is a, a battery inverter that has terminals for batteries, kind of like those wire diagrams that we were looking at earlier. And uh, so what this says is um, if you want to AC couple a solar array to a battery inverter, um, all of the solar production needs to be either consumed by loads or used to charge batteries. So what's, what is profound about that? Isn't that how it's supposed to work? The, the issue is, is when all the loads are already being supplied and the batteries are already fully charged, you have to be able to turn off that power source and say, you know what, we don't need it right now. Well, that turning off the solar array in the middle of the day because the batteries are charged means you're going to use your batteries when there might otherwise be solar power available. So it's not the most elegant solution. But the more elegant solution is to buy more expensive stuff and you're just using the very tip top of your battery capacity at times when you pretty much already have an overabundant amount of power. So it's really you know, one of these technical issues, it's not that big of a deal to turn the solar array off for 15 minutes, drain the batteries a little, and then use the solar array to charge them right back up again. But alternately, you could use smart controllers to turn on and off loads as a function of the PV array. You know, I could have a uh, electric heater that's four kilowatts with floor heater, you know, $20 at Walmart, I buy an electric floor heater, put it on a, put it in my garage, put it on a smart plug, and then if the batteries are full and the solar array is on and my load is low, I could turn on, you know, what's called a, a dump load uh, to consume that solar power rather than turning the array off and running off my battery. So there's ways to use digital controls 
um, to match your load to your consumption uh, to prevent having to start and stop your solar array multiple times. Um, and, and the way that it's the, the battery inverters communicating with the solar inverter is by alternating the, alternating the line frequency of the home. So your home electronics will not turn off if the frequency goes from 60 hertz to 59 hertz. But what will turn off is the solar array due to its grid tied protections. So the battery inverter, your more expensive battery inverters, the ones that are synchronous, the ones that can be AC coupled, uh, will have the ability to do this frequency shifting in order to protect their batteries. Um, using stackable inverters builds redundancy into the system. So when one battery inverter fails, the other can continue. It's not so straightforward. Um, even when you have double stacked inverters, one is the master and the others are the slaves. And so uh, the master inverter kind of tells the, you know, the other inverters when to turn on and when to turn off, you know, uh, some more, there's different modes of operation. Some of the higher end products will uh, cycle the inverters regularly so that they all kind of age in a uniform manner. Well, what's, what's not foolproof about these systems is if there's a failure in the master inverter, you'll still lose power to the home and then you'll likely have to go and, and uh, reprogram one of the slave inverters to be the new master inverter while the master inverter is being re replaced. And so, you know, just cause you have two battery inverters that are double stacked and parallel etherneted together uh, does not mean you have a completely foolproof system that won't require any uh, technical knowledge from the homeowner. Looking at some other battery inverter features, here's a uh, 12 volt uh, low amperage auxiliary outlet that can be used to power a fan. And so what, what I, I use those to circulate air in the battery room. Um, uh, transfer relay, 60 amp transfer relay to switch between um, the grid and the generator. Nothing, nothing big, no big deal. Uh, there's a equalize setting on this battery inverter. You really only use this equalization for unsealed flooded lead acid. And what it does is it, it applies, it's energy intense and it applies a high voltage to the batteries in order to uh, uh, break some of the uh, sulfur decay that occurs on the battery anodes up. And so equalization is a battery maintenance task. Generally you'll do an off-grid setting uh, equalization in the morning on a clear sunny day so that you have enough power to maintain an equalization charge for a few hours. We talked about load control. And so what I wanted to kind of end class with was a, a design proposal where we try and have all of our cake and eat it too. You know, what we want is a, a cheap battery inverter that might only be an off-grid battery inverter. You know, one that is cheap but powerful enough to run the entire house during a, a off-grid. So we get that off-grid capability because our, our grid-tied solar inverter, even if it has battery capability, is not large enough to run your entire house. And maybe they work together too. You know, one way they can work together in an off-grid setting is you can have your, your base load inverter, your master inverter being there to handle almost all of your loads. 
And then you have a, a synchronous battery inverter that can synchronize to the master inverter. You have a synchronous battery inverter in a demand management mode. So these, these lithium ion grid tied inverters are not just there to, to absorb the solar array energy and discharge it slowly overnight. That's how they function in a residential setting. In a commercial setting, they'll communicate with the consumption meter, like what we saw in our home automation, and they'll say, okay, whenever the building load is above a 100 kilowatt demand level, let's turn the battery on and, and shave off peak demand from the building facility. And that's how a lot of commercial businesses are charged for their electricity. And using batteries for peak demand management can be quite cost effective. Now, using my digital control system for demand reduction is even more cost effective, but you know, batteries can make even further inroads and work together for that matter. Now, SolarEdge gives you this nice high voltage solar array up on the rooftop. And so they're sending back high voltage from the solar array. By high voltage, I'm still saying under 600 volts, but you know, more than 300 volts. They're stepping up the voltage to its maximum potential before sending it back to the inverter. And so, you know, what, what we want is a grid tied inverter with some battery backup power and maybe a, a, a top shelf lithium ion battery that's for rapid discharging and, and is just a small battery as part of our giant off-grid system. But this is actually, you know, so let's, let's get further into it. And so we have our, our solar array up on top of the roof. It's meeting the rapid shutdown requirements that, you know, you have to de-energize the solar array with a touch of a button and these, these module level power electronics are able to cut power right up on top of the roof. And then, you know, what's nice about the voltage optimization is you don't need to have that many circuits of power up to your rooftop. And you get this nice high voltage DC coming down. And normally it would end on the solar edge inverter down below. But what I want to do is also tap on to this high voltage circuit with a separate charge controller. And the reason why I want to do that is I want to have not just a lithium ion battery that's for daily cycling and for demand management. I might want to have a, uh, you know, bargain bin used battery uh, whether it be lead acid or lithium ion sitting there for backup power. And I'll need that additional storage. I'll need that cheaper battery in order to pull everything off grid. And so I don't want to have to charge my battery through the AC charger of the, of the, of the battery inverter. I want to directly charge that battery through a, a DC charge controller um, because I like that. I like that style. So the question is, you know, Solar Edge makes it pretty clear that they do not want you to hack their system to draw power off of that DC bus. They want it only going to their product and their inverter. So they're not going to tell you if it's possible to tap onto that DC bus to do other things with it. They'll tell you it won't work. Well, okay, but I want to use Solar Edge because either I have MLPE requirements up on the roof or my ground mount's real far away from the house and I want that stepped up voltage, but Solar Edge doesn't really make a good off grid inverter. They have an okay grid tied battery inverter with lithium ion, but they don't have anything well suited for off grid. And so I want to have a separate off grid battery and a separate off grid inverter. But what if I could tap onto that DC bus with an additional charge controller? Well, what would I need? Well, first off, you know, this is a, a DC bus that is rated up to 600 volts. 
And so I need a 600 volt charge controller. There's only two 600 volt charge controllers on the market. One's made by Schneider, one's made by Morningstar. Morningstar has a better reputation than Schneider. I use Schneider because it's a big brand. Um, the most popular charge controller on the market is 300 volts and it's an Outback charge controller. And I'd probably switch over to Outback on my next install. Um, so can we combine these two things together? Well, Solar Edge, how they work is you, you have a, a solar module, and normally the solar module is outputting uh, 400 volts, let's just call it 8 amps, or 40 volts and 8 amps, and that would give you uh, 320 watts of solar power. Well, what, what, and, and then these panels get strung up in series, so voltage, 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 but also per code, you have to give some clearance for temperature fluctuation or, or more. And so these, they're, you're giving on a, on a non-controlled, uncontrolled solar array, you're giving a 56% headroom for voltage fluctuation on the array because of temperature and general oversizing. You know, when you use solar edges, voltage regulators, you only need to do a 25% a oversize. And then what solar edge says is since that headroom is there, we're going to put it to use. And so, you know, the, the cable is rated for 600 volts and under normal operating conditions, the solar array may only be getting up to 300 volts, but we're going to step it up as high as we can go which will drop the amperage and, and give you a little bit more system efficiency out of it. And so what they're saying is every voltage coming out of each solar panel is being adjusted by the voltage regulator to give you at the end of the day, you know, a high voltage output circuit. And so if one module gets shaded and the voltage on that module drops, they, they adjust the voltage so that the module is back up to where it would be and have a very low amperage instead. And that gets rid of the series wiring conundrum where voltage differences from one module to the next can wreak havoc on system performance. By using these voltage controllers, Solar Edge overcomes that. And the reason why that's important is because the way that the Solar Edge system works and you go and you know they this is them telling you that you're not really allowed to, to hack their system without their permission but the way that the solar edge inverter um you know this is this is saying you know if a solar module is completely shaded it can cause the the individual power optimizer to shut down but it won't affect the performance on the rest of the circuit because the voltage controller can, can remove itself from the circuit and bypass with the other power. As long as the minimum number of unshaded power optimizers are connected in the circuit. If there are fewer optimizers connected in the circuit, then the inverter won't get enough power and the inverter won't be able to turn on. And so you read further into the, the Solar Edge documentation and you say, okay, well, you know, here's our 320 watt optimizer for 60 cell modules. Here's the 370 for 72 cell modules. You got our operating range, uh, short circuit currents, maximum power output. You know, it's on the, the this is just reading the, the spec sheet. You know, we get a, a maximum power output of 60 volts. So it can take that 40 volt panel and step the panel up to 60 volts. 50% volt increase, accommodate that extra headroom if it wants to. But this is where the, the real meat of the, the spec sheet analysis gets us. 
now we have a, a minimum string length of for the, the entry level optimizers of eight. So the minimum number of modules on a circuit you can have is eight, and the maximum is 25. And that's a pretty big range. And what they're saying is, if we don't have the power of eight solar panels under full power up on that rooftop, the inverter will not turn on. But if we have more power than what eight modules can, then can produce, you can have all the way up to 25 on it. So, okay, you know, what that, what that means is that there's a, a difference of, uh, you know, 17 optimizers. And if, if, you know, I guess there was a typo in here and I said eight instead of seven, it should be 17 instead of 18, and this should be eight instead of seven. And so we say if we have 17 optimizers at 300 watts each, you know, that is uh, about five kilowatts of power difference. And so if I have a, a fully loaded solar edge 25 module circuit, I could actually drain five kilowatts of power off of it before the inverter turns off. And so what that means is I actually can tap on DC loads to my solar edge home run circuit and still have the solar edge system run. And so what that means is that I could actually have a a um, you know a a separate you know, I have my, my high voltage DC bus running down to my solar edge inverter at the side of the building. And the solar edge inverter needs to be tied into this East DC bus so that it can signal the power optimizers to turn on and check in. You know, they have their own kind of proprietary communication, but voltage is voltage. And so I can take my other 600 volt charge controller, tap it onto this DC uh, solar array bus and then use its own output to maintain its own battery bank. So off of the same solar array, off of the same DC bus, I have a lithium ion battery inverter that might go with the top shelf lithium ion, the most responsive, the most expensive lithium ion battery on the market, but a very small amount. And then I might have a separate battery bank for a lower end, either flooded lead acid, or lower end lithium ion on its own charge controller pulling off the same DC bus. And, and that's important because then you don't have to have, you know, then you can have your module level panel electronic compliance, but still have your off-grid components. Then you could have your long distance ground mounts and still have your off-grid components while using the solar edge system, which really wasn't intended to be used in this manner. And they say, well, you know, doesn't that mean you're gonna void your warranty for doing this? You know, maybe, maybe not. It kind of depends on how you talk to Solar Edge about it if you do run into an issue. You know, if you can definitively prove that, you know, the warranty issue is, is from their inverter, then you'll be all right. If you had poor workmanship and you toasted a uh, uh, panel board, uh, usually they don't treat their consumer customers as good as they treat their installer customers in those uh, circumstances. And for the installer, it's kind of a, a crapshoot on if, if your own workmanship messes something up on if it's gonna be replaced or not. Generally under warranty, generally the, the lower end uh, component manufacturers have worse warranties than the higher end component manufacturers. But the, the point is these are off-grid systems that are costing you know, tens of thousands, you know, 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 dollars. And so the warranty on one, you know, $3,000 component, you know, while important, it's not the ultimate design factor in the in, to be considered. I mean, you might save, you know, a substantial amount of money doing a high voltage run from the solar array out into the field to where you're point of use is going to be uh, that could, 
you know, substantially compensate you for the loss of the warranty by using their system in a way that's not like officially supported. And we're trying to talk about what's what's possible, not what is, um, you know, a, necessarily allowable. We're trying to talk about the design decisions between when the manufacturer says something won't work, but they won't give you a reason why, versus what the true technical capabilities are uh, of this. And, and SolarEdge, you know, they're saying, okay, well, not a generator, but if you are AC coupling us with a battery inverter, this is how we want you to do it. Make sure you're using frequency shifting to turn it off. Okay, so when I put together this slide, it was really with the mindset that the only way to do off-grid in a cost-effective manner was with industrial lead acid. Um, but since then, and just in the past, you know, less than 12 months, the cost of used lithium-ion batteries has plummeted to the point where in my own practice, I would recommend to an off-grid customer that they not use lead acid, but they use lithium ion instead. Even in that case, you're often buying the lithium ion in a, a 48 volt or similar battery pack and your 48 volt charge controllers. Um, it turns out when we're talking about like 48 volt circuits or 600 volt circuits, these are just the nicknames to the circuits and the voltage range is going to vary uh, more greatly. And as we talked about yesterday, there might be an expanded voltage range for an unsealed flooded lead acid battery versus a sealed lithium ion battery. But at any point, we have the, the DC bus going on to our solar edge inverter, the lithium ion, uh, and we are using the exact same solar array and the exact same DC side tap to charge up our uh, lower voltage whole house batteries. And this is kind of interesting because it, it comes into which do you want to do first? And so what's, what's very common is to just go ahead and install a grid tied solar edge solar array. Fine. You know, one thing, one upgrade that I've done on some sites and you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence on whether or not it's worthwhile or not. I generally appreciate it after it's there, but while I'm paying for it and it's not doing anything yet, I'm a little dubious. But that's the Solar Edge makes a, a, a battery inverter and a non-battery inverter. And the battery inverter does more stuff. It costs more money. You know, so you might upgrade by spending, you know, on a, on a $2,000 inverter you know, it might cost $3,000 to get the battery inverter. And so the Solar Edge battery inverter, and this is not true of all battery inverters, but the Solar Edge battery inverter does not need a battery to function. And so the past couple of years, whenever I've been doing a Solar Edge system, I put in their battery inverter without the battery because lithium ion's too expensive to be justifiable in my neck of the woods at that point in time. And so what we've done as a starting point is the solar array and the battery inverter and had it be grid tied and not even put the battery on yet. And then at the next starting point, it would say, okay, well, I don't wanna do a complete off grid conversion yet, but let's go ahead and add a little bit of lithium ion storage. And so whenever there's a power outage, it provides a little bit of backup load, but not enough to power the whole house. And so that's not particularly satisfactory to someone who's spent tons of money on a solar array, tons of money on a battery. If they still have tons of money left over, they might say, okay, well, what's the next step in, in running my home for, you know, days off grid and not just, you know, not just, um, you know, hours. 
And the answer might mean different things to different people. You know, the answer might be, okay, well, that's when you put in a manual transfer switch and a generator and you run it in a either or configuration. You know, you have your backed up loads running off your solar array and then your main loads running off your house. Of course, true preppers will say, you know, well, that's fine, but in a, a true emergency, we're gonna run out of gas. The gas generator uh, is only gonna go so far. And at that point, we can say, okay, well, you already have the solar edge system on site. Let's tap on a charge controller to that DC bus bar and then put in a larger, cheaper, less responsive battery and run that on a on a very cheap, purely off-grid inverter. And maybe we run that inverter onto a, a generator interlock switch. So during the emergency, you go and you flick the interlock switch and you got some power coming in from your uh, solar edge inverter and you got the rest of the power coming in from your off-grid battery inverter. And uh, what, is, what is particularly interesting about that is if you decided to do the whole kit caboodle and completely convert into 100% off-grid, at that point, the battery inverter can be reprogrammed to only manage peak load with your very responsive uh, lithium-ion battery, and then your other system can be there to provide base load. And so what, what is the elegance of this kind of approach is it's the, the cheapest way to get off-grid full, fully is to have a combination of battery chemistries, expensive battery chemistries, and cheap battery chemistries. And there's not a lot of support out there for combining multiple battery chemistries on the same system. And so you are forced to kind of hack something like this together. You know, another thing that's nice about this kind of system is that double redundancy um, has been achieved uh, in terms of if one system component fails, we, we don't completely lose power to the other system. So, you know, if the solar edge inverter fails, we can still power the whole house off of the, the battery inverter. If the, uh, if the uh, battery inverter fails, we still got uh, some critical load power from the lithium ion battery. And then there's a small generator there to play free safety. And so we've achieved kind of a, a doubly redundant system without really having repeat parts. You know, we're not overspending on high-end battery inverters uh, with enough capacity to power the whole house, uh, but we are enabling, you know, better battery storage technology on site for the day-to-day. And then load controls kind of make up the difference. I guess one thing we don't have a slide in here for is people are discovering that, you know, battery inverters such as the Tesla Powerwall are not capable of powering an entire house all at the same time. And so there's, there's a number of companies that are, are trying to do what I just showed you with home energy controls to um, manage to make sure the devices turn on at separate times um, so that the whole house can be backed up off of a smaller inverter uh, without tripping any breakers. And so I guess the, the takeaway from this is with, with proper planning, you know, it's, We've always thought about solar as like, oh, connect to the bottom of the bus bar for a supply side, for a line side load, connect to the top of the bus bar with a supply side load, you know, but now in, in off-grid design, what's really needed is an automatic transfer switch between the grid and the home uh, to trigger, to isolate the grid from the home. Although the cheaper version is to do a manual transfer switch instead of an automatic transfer switch, which is, you know, but even the manual transfer switches are expensive. And sometimes your local authority will want you to do uh, uh, still a visible knife switch disconnect on top of an automatic transfer switch. So I, I don't know. Um, you know, often I'll, I'll just uh, 
have a, auto, a manual transfer switch because it's the least amount of money, but that's also something about doing solar projects in, in Mississippi. Let's see. Um, you know, like, like I pick out, I have a, a particularly cheap off grid inverter, which, uh, I've tried to run a house full time off of. And even the manufacturer says this is not intended to be a full time inverter. And it just, you know, it, it does not have the same performance as the top shelf, uh, inverters. But one thing it does have is, its own brand of generator and a plug where the generate a small portable generator plugs right into it. So I guess what I'm trying to, to say is that, you know, even within the context of a batteryless grid tied inverter with a transfer switch and a generator, you know, that's a, a path towards backup power. But with the right product selection, you can you can say, okay, well, you know, I'll put that solar array uh, either at the bottom of the bus bar for a simple interconnection. If I'm doing a supply side tap, I might want to go ahead and buy, you know, uh, a dedicated service panel, such as we saw, you know, at the earlier part of the program. You know, some of these these expensive, because I didn't need to scroll all the way back. <laughs> And we didn't need to buy one of these expensive all-in-one service panels. But if I'm doing a supply-side connection, I might start installing an energy service panel uh, with connections for not just solar inverters, but also battery inverters. And not just one breaker area, but multiple breaker areas for stackable inverters. And then I might even consider... Uh, buying instead of a generator, you know, I might in instead buy a uh, or instead of a whole house generator, I might spend the same amount of money on a large, cheap off grid battery inverter and land that on a generator interlock switch uh, instead of spending $500 on a 200 amp manual transfer switch. I might spend $40 on a 40 amp you know, generator interlock switch and only power my home uh, with a small amount of power during a blackout and maybe implement load control uh, to get me through that outage. So I guess the, the, the you know, Another conclusion is that, you know, it is possible to squeeze a little bit more value out of these devices uh, through uh, a solid understanding of how they work and the voltage and amperage involved. Um, and, and you might surprise yourself by finding some functionality that the manufacturer doesn't actually support. Uh, whether it's wiring the backup load to a generator interlock switch to try and power your whole house or to tap onto a DC bus bar that you're not supposed to or by implementing digital controls to squeeze a little bit more devices onto the same um, output connection. Um... So you know, I guess the takeaway is it's it's still quite expensive to take a whole house off grid. Uh, I would not do it for personally. I would not a regular sized home. I would not even start thinking about whole house off grid for a budget of less than seventy thousand uh, dollars for everything you need. And even then, you would be getting kind of a, a low end uh, off grid system. The the best one. You know, the best reliance, the, the customer that said, you know, I'm doing off grid and I want to make sure that I don't underspend so that I don't have to worry about it. You know, that kind of build for just a, a medium sized home was a uh, hundred thousand.
And so let's see, this is this is a, a budget that I put together for an off-grid house where it's like, okay, we got the, the solar panels are cheap now. Uh, the storage inverter is 3,000 plus the optimizers, you know, small lithium-ion battery. Um, you know, and then and then and then a separate batteryless inverter. You know, that's kind of interesting because if you have a, a small battery inverter and then you AC couple another inverter next to it, you know, this system would get us up to 12 kilowatts of of power during the day and then only seven kilowatts at night. And so if you can load shift some heavy load devices such as your water heating to during the day, you know, you that's another kind of advantage that AC coupling gets you that DC coupling doesn't. With AC coupling where you have multiple inverters during the day, you have the combined power output of all of the inverters going into your AC load. If you put the solar array on DC ahead of the inverter, then you only have the power output of the battery inverter itself. Uh, so then we got the racking, balance the system material, you know, a dedicated 12 kilowatt uh, off-grid inverter. Well, this has actually gone up in, in, in price now with import tariffs. So, you know, this is, is now closer to $3,000 rather than $1,200. Now, this is what you can expect to spend on an industrial flooded lead acid bank or maybe a used lithium ion bank. Charge controllers are more expensive than their inverter counterparts. Your gas generator. As far as the smart home hardware goes, I've also gotten more familiar with that than when I put the system online. So I would I would recommend you know, spending at least a thousand dollars as an installation budget on smart home load controls because you know the thermostat replacement, the energy monitors inside your service panel, and and then you know there you might you know you can you can really uptick your smart home budget too. You know that's kind of something I'm looking at is not working so much on a roof, working inside the home. So the smart home budget's probably unrealistic. Uh, but just the material cost for like a full range of of setup for um, an off grid home, just the materials alone could be forty five thousand dollars or more. And so by the time you put in you know labor and profit and overhead, you know you're you're really looking at a hundred thousand dollar project to be what it takes to take a full house off grid. And I know 100,000, some of you are thinking, well, you know, don't some homes start at 100,000? And you know, okay, you know that, you know, good homes cost more than $100,000, but you're starting to think like, well, you know, is it worth it? Let's say I have a $300,000 home. Is it worth it to, to be a $400,000 home and have it be off grid? And uh, the short answer is probably not. You're probably not able to, to take that $300,000 home, put $100,000 of off-grid technology into it, and then turn around and sell it for $400,000. If that's your strategy, you're probably going to lose your money. You know, if the strategy is to save, you know, $30,000 of grid interconnection fees, uh, you know, there's, there's that. But it's also, you know, electricity is expensive. And when you're looking at a, a mortgage payment of four or five hundred dollars a month on a three hundred thousand dollar home, and then you look at your electric bill of one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars a month, you know the the point of it is, you know, you can put these things into long term financing and have them come out to be uh, relatively even with your electric bill. And sometimes with grid tied policy, you can't get there because the rules are so stacked against the solar owner that no amount of grid tied solar is cost effective, uh, at least any better than what you would get by spending more money and going completely off grid. 
So you know, I guess the the message of this program now is, you know, it used to be that living off grid was a real pipe dream or that it would confine you to like energy poverty. And almost like solar 10 years ago, where for the first time ever, you know, a solar array would generate a payback uh, within its lifetime. You know, now we're starting to see off-grid systems start to do the same thing. And so maybe 10 years from now, we're going to see a situation where um, off-grid homes become commonplace because, you know, the costs come down to the point where the utility doesn't want to play nice with solar owners. And so, you know, we we start to see a, a more uptick in, in grid disconnection, uh, either out of necessity or for fun. Okay, so with that, we're out of time. I'm going to run through the quiz real quick to see if there's there's anything that I forgot. Um, and I'm looking at it. Uh, Huh. There's there's one question that needs to be that y'all need to be aware of because the answer is wrong and it's a true or false question. Uh, the question is for most of the USA, running on the grid on most overcast days is more cost effective than running on a generator. The answer is true, but it's coded false. So um, there's there's two questions about that are similar to this. One is is running on a generator on overcast days more cost effective than running on a large battery bank? And the answer to that is false. And then the, the question that's keyed in wrong, for most of the USA, running on the grid on overcast days is more cost effective than running on a generator. And that's true, but the answer is false. You gotta, so just take a note, I'm gonna say it one more time on the quiz. For most of the USA, running on grid on most overcast days is more cost effective than running on a generator. You need to put down that the answer is false or you'll get it wrong, but the answer is actually true. Um, and then this other stuff, what's the name of home automation communication protocol that we talked about? We said Z-Wave. Um, the last point we didn't say, so heating loads. So there's some people are concerned about like, okay, with heating loads, um, is, is electric heating bad for inverters? And, and the answer is actually no. Heating loads are fine for inverters. What's bad for battery inverters are, uh, are like tough motor loads, like water pumps. That, that turn on with a compressor uh, very intensely for a short period of time and then drop back off again. A heating load is intense, but it's continuous and it's steady. And so the only problem with a heating load is that it uses a lot of electricity. It's not hard per se for the same amount of energy as other loads. In fact, it's easier for the same amount of energy than other loads. It just takes a lot of energy. So, you know, it, it becomes a capacity issue. Um, whereas I know on, on at least lower end battery inverters, there's often a separate terminal for pumps because uh, cheaper battery inverters can't take the water pumps as easily as the higher end ones with more expensive parts. And so with that, we are out of time. Um, you're welcome to email me uh, with, with questions. Let me, uh, I have a different email. It's a little bit easier to use. So I'm gonna put that into here. Uh, and as I said, after, um, after class, I will, um, after class, I generally, uh, upload the course videos to YouTube so that you can reference them later. And so if you're interested in that, uh, send me an email, jrscromer at gmail.com. Uh, my website's community.solar, www.community.solar, so you can find me there and I'll answer your questions. Uh, with that, we're at the end of the program and I'll pass it back to Half Moon.
All right. Well, thanks very much, JR. Uh, like you said, the series is then finished. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. And thank you very much to our great speaker, Mr. Cromer. Thanks for all your expertise and information. Uh, remember, attendees, that your quiz, uh, which Mr. Cromer went over, will be sent to your email here shortly. Uh, once you've successfully completed that, you'll have access to your certificate. If you don't pass the quiz right away, you'll be able to read take it until you do receive a passing grade. Uh, if, like he, uh, Mr. Cromer said, if anyone has any questions um, for him or myself, uh, feel free to email me as well and I can pass things along for you. Uh, and you can use one of the emails that I've sent to you and just respond to it. Um, otherwise, again, thanks everyone for being here and thanks JR and everyone have a great rest of your day.